Things were thrown slightly into confusion last night when Scotland and Wales decided it would be a great idea to put Portugal back on the naughty list and make it possible for people coming back from Portugal to Scotland and Wales to go into quarantine. However, in England, you don't have to go into quarantine. So if you fly back from Portugal into England and then drive into Scotland, what happens then? If you fly back into Cardiff from Portugal and you drive back into England... What happens then? We'll be trying to get an explanation of that and what on earth is going on. Uh, we're going to be speaking to the chief executive of Heathrow Airport. He's got a few pricey things to say about what needs to happen right now uh, between the government, the travel business, industry and everybody else as well. Nick Dubois joins me this morning too. Uh, he's going to be talking about what exactly the week has been like for the government because, quite frankly, we are still in the midst of this pandemic. However, the schools are going back. Certain people are going back to work in their offices. Some restaurants are open. Do you know that something like 100 million meals were sold thanks to the Eat Out to Help Out scheme? Well, if 100 million meals can be sold, how come people can't go back to work? What are you telling me? It's all right to go out to a restaurant, but it's not okay to go back to an office? I think that is all a bit of a con. Lots more to talk about, of course. We'll be talking about the migrant crisis. We'll be talking about the BBC as well, because I'm going to say this. I think the new Director General of the BBC has suddenly found some common sense. He's telling the likes of Gary Lineker, Emily Maitlis, Lewis Goodall, all the people uh, that politicise on their social media accounts to shut up, sit down and stop giving us your personal views. If you want to have personal views, go work somewhere else. I think he's on the right track, don't you? 0344 499 1000. Also, it's Friday, so Martin Maligon returns with the Perrier Awards. And, of course, we want to hear from you as well. 0344 499 1000. You'll listen to me, Mike Graham, right here on the fastest growing radio station on the planet. It is, of course, Talk Radio. Mid-morning with Mike Graham. Talk Radio. So the papers this morning, full of all manner of different types of stories. Interestingly, uh, it would appear that there is now a growing clamour, which I've been going on about for almost a month now, for people to get back to the offices, repopulate the cities of this great country, and industry now leaders warning the government that if it's not done properly, and if quarantine does not disappear altogether from the way that we now live, not only is the travel business finished, but trade is going to be affected as well. Uh, Let's kick things off this morning with Nick Dubois, former Conservative MP, author of Confessions of a Recovering MP, of course, talk radio presenter as well. Nick, a very good morning to you. A good morning to you, Mike. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. What sort of a week has it been, do you think, for the government? There's been that incredible migrant crisis story where 416 people arrived on our shores in one uh, day alone. Pretty Patel this morning tweeting out that they've managed to deport some more people. That sort of fight goes on. The business fight goes on. Uh, and now still the kind of quarantine madness goes on. Well, to be fair, I, the part the government and the whips were really keen to get the MPs back. Uh, they always like to have MPs in Parliament, even under these conditions, because mm. they think they can control them more and everyone's better behaved and they all get on message. Now, it hasn't all been bad for the government this week. There have been some things, frankly, they've got right and they are right to point to. But it hasn't been a good week. And uh, funny enough, the quarantine, I think, is something that is now confounding loads of people, including MPs, for a number of reasons. First of all, if you can't fly in and out of this country, this country's economy is going to continue to suffer. It's fundamental to how we do business. And when you've got 30 other countries that are implementing uh, a very satisfactory testing scheme at the airports and then up to seven days later and avoiding the long quarantine we have, you have to ask yourself, why are we not doing that? Yeah. And frankly, I think the airports are right. They are, and the travel industry are right, to say it's come a bit of a lottery now. And we've seen that with, uh, if you'd been a betting man, Mike, uh, and as I was, I would have put a bet yesterday that Portugal was going into quarantine yes. or effectively travellers coming back. So people have been out rushing, buying tickets, paying premium prices to try and avoid quarantine. And of course, now they've been hit with a double whammy of not having spent that money and probably still coming back. So it's got to be sorted out. And the obvious way to go forward, and I think the resistance is clearly coming from number 10, is to ramp up this uh, ability to test people when they arrive, take their temperatures and as well as a test and have them tested uh, seven days later. 
that could reduce quarantine substantially and make a big difference on the government's fortunes and actually on the economic fortunes of the country. Well, that's right, because we keep hearing different stories on the testing front, don't we? Because every time you say uh, to the government, you know, let's get some testing done at airports, they say, well, the trouble with that is, is that you could still be incubating the disease and the test doesn't really show you anything. But if that's the logic, then why bother testing anybody at any point for anything? Well, the, the system being proposed by the airlines is precisely the system that has been uh, also uh, used in the MHS and for key workers. So right. I don't see why we are facing that difficulty. The fact of the matter is there is a f- corona fear r- virus running through number 10 in a way because they've been so badly burnt by what happened in the early months. And that's completely understandable that they fear a second wave and they are still coming down on, if you like, health protection, which I think um, they, you, you don't ignore, but the fact of the matter is, I think we are being overcautious. Yeah. Now, I'm not a medic, I'll get lots of criticism for that, I'm sure. But the overcaution coming from number 10 is and uh, now, I think, um, dominating so much that we are actually seeing ourselves harming ourselves, self-harming ourselves through what we're doing to the economy um, but by this over-caution. And that over-caution is reflected in the policy on quarantine at the moment. Yeah, absolutely right. I, I thought the Prime Minister's questions were slightly odd this week as well mm. because it seemed very, very ill-tempered, much more so than normal, almost as though something had happened. And it's very clear to me that, that, that there's quite a lot of correspondence going on between Sir Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson. They seem to write to each other quite a lot, uh, but then they kind of reveal that they've written to each other uh, in a public arena, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But, but there was a lot of rancour, it seemed. Well, I, I think on the Labour benches, there is frustration. They realise they should be 10, poll, 10 points ahead in the polls and they're just not getting the cut through. And that is frustration boiling over. And I think you see that. It's almost an, uh, 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 over the summer. They think the government have had a really bad summer. They were expecting to be doing much better than they're doing. On the government front, if you'd been Boris Johnson going into PMQs, you would have looked back over the U-turns, the A-level crisis, all the difficulties you've had, and you would have expected to have got a, a bit of a pasting. So I think both people went into it where they're one very cautious and one very frustrated. Yeah. And it actually wasn't a very good question time in, in that sense. I don't mm. think the Prime Minister had a particularly good question time. And I think Keir Starmer no. didn't do No, I mean, I, I said to Charlotte Ivers on the day, I was really looking forward to it because I thought, you know, there's actually something to get your teeth into, a bit of meat and drink for those of us who like that sort of thing. And it was kind of underwhelming in a way and, and a bit disappointing. Yeah, and, and, you know, remember, Mike, look, it's, it is theatre, uh, PMQs. A lot of good work goes on in Parliament, but PMQs, the object for the Prime Minister is not to answer questions, and the, object for the, uh, the objective for the uh, leader of the opposition is to ask as many awkward ones as he can. No one really learns anything in PMQs, but it's a key thermometer. It, it, it helps define how MPs feel on both sides of the benches. It helps set the tone for government. And I'm afraid, I think PMQs, which was, as you say, um, uh, disappointing in some respects, but uh, uh, also reflected pretty much the angst that is in Parliament. Remember, the Conservatives have been told this week there could be huge tax rises, something that is extremely alien to many people on the benches. And I share their concern what the possibility of huge tax rises could do to our economic growth. That is festering away. The WhatsApp groups amongst MPs are still talking about this is a ludicrous idea that we will ramp up um, taxes at a time when we're trying to uh, recover the economy. So there's that anxiousness going on. That You had the quarantine, which they're not in Parliament, obviously, now, but it's been an ongoing sore. Um, plus, uh, there's genuine concerns that the more division you get between, the, um, between Scotland and Wales and England particularly, the more the union comes under threat. So for the Conservatives, you know, there's quite a lot of angst out there at the moment. But having said that, you know, look how we are doing in terms of controlling infection rates in this country at the moment. The government cannot cannot unreasonably point to how they're doing much better than elsewhere in Europe. Yes, there's been confusion over testing this week with capacity issues, but nevertheless, we are doing hundreds of thousands of tests a week where other countries are struggling not to. So, there, you know, that is positive. Pretty Patel is right to point out 
that actually we may hear about those uh, immigrants who are risking their lives and trying to get into the country illegally at the same time. She's actually absolutely right to point out that where she can, she is turning people back and they are being sent back by plane to their destinations, but the lawyers are in, uh, slowing that process down. And she can point to some successes even in France where they have stopped uh, people coming over. So it's not all doom and gloom and it's easy to, if you're a conservative, to feel that. No, indeed. And I saw them packing up some dinghies as well, which looked like they were going to be shipped back to France, although I'm not sure they wouldn't be better off just destroying the damn thing so that nobody can actually use them again. But you put out a tweet yesterday, Nick, about the comparison charts to, between us and yes. other countries of the world. And you noted uh, quite, I think, shrewdly that, you know, there was a time when every single day we were being told by the media, oh, look how terrible it is in comparison to other countries that we're doing. We're the worst in Europe. Then we were the worst in the world. And now they're not making the comparisons anymore, strangely enough. No, they're not. And, and of course, it is the nature of much of our media that they are only interested in uh, t talking about the bad news. The fact is, uh, when you look at uh, the countries that other media commentators have held up, left wing particularly, have held up as prime examples of where things are going well, like Germany, mm. we are on a par for the way we are managing with Germany. We are managing the infection rate. No credit has been given to the government for that. We look at Spain, which is something like five times, um, well, considerably higher than that, actually seeing an infection of rate nearly 4,000 uh, a day compared to what we are seeing here. You can see that the government have, have, have actually got a pretty reliable strategy in the way they are dealing with local lockdowns and how they are trying to control the infection. Um, as I say, I... I think, though, that success is almost breeding now the, the policy that, that, that will allow them to say, well, look, our quarantine policy is obviously working. Uh, no, that is not the case. They are two completely different things. Absolutely behind the government with their local lockdown strategy, the swift response that they're actually doing, and the test and trace that uh, gets a lot of criticism, but it's actually broadly reaching quite a large number of people. But this sort of shut the economy down approach, which is what effectively quarantine is doing, not just for the holiday tourists, because they're a relatively small part of it, but actually for the business economy, business events, hotels in London, not even bothering to open because right. there's no business visitors into this country. And why would they come here? if they have to spend 14 weeks in their hotel room, 14 well, days in their well, hotel Well, exactly room. right. I mean, the only place you can get a hotel room currently is if you arrive on a beach in Dover, apparently, where you get uh, shipped mm. off to the nearest Britannia uh, uh, episode and see how you get along. But the other big story, of course, of the week, which, again, for me, is totally and utterly manufactured, is this business about Tony Abbott. You know, because we all know what's going on here. Nobody's actually saying what's going on. But what's actually going on is the Ramonas in the media and the Ramonas uh, in the political world are trying to destabilise the Brexit talks because they think that Tony Abbott somehow is homophobic and a misogynist. You know, if it wasn't anything to do with Brexit, I don't think would care, would they? Well, his chief of staff, um, uh, Tony Abbott's former chief of staff, has come out very robustly and uh, on talk radio, in yes. fact, and basically uh, pushed back on, on these character assassination uh, that's going on at the moment. Now, you know, I haven't even seen the comments he said, and I'm sure some of them uh, are probably what these days people regard as entirely inappropriate. But the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of a lot of hypocrisy going on around this. We saw Liz Truss in the House of Commons very neatly pull up Labour on this, who are starting to, uh, who, who one of their charges is he's he's a misogynist. And, and she rightly pointed out that the very same people are making this charge. Uh, were the ones that rushed to the fence of John McDonald, who basically was saying that a, 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 a <laughs> Esther McVeigh should be hung. Yes. You know, I, I mean, quite honestly, um, uh, that people need to get a, get a grip of themselves when they work themselves up to hysteria. Uh, as we saw some of the Labour MPs doing yeah. yesterday. Also, to be um, honest, Nick, I mean, this is a guy who may have some what you might call traditional conservative views. Now, the last time I checked, it wasn't illegal to have traditional conservative views based on any number of reasons. And, you know, the fact that people might not agree with that or agree with his uh, particular you know, political beliefs doesn't make him in any way uh, disqualified for a job or doesn't make him in any way some kind of war criminal. Well, he's very qualified for trade. That's the key point the yeah. government are making. He's extremely qualified for trade. A deal with Australia particularly is something we want. But we are a country that is on the verge of going out to make international trade deals mm. uh, the minute we're out of the EU. Uh, Liz Truss wants around a very experienced people. 
he clearly qualifies for that. However, my, uh, Mike, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of placing another bet. I, I could end up very poor at the end of this. <laughs> um, but, but, but I'm beginning to think number 10 and not going to appoint him because of the row that's been going on. And that will be uh, a tragic uh, uh, turn of events, not least because what it tells you uh, is that anybody uh, can be stopped from serving this government because the sort of establishment left don't like him. Well, you know, they're very, very well, as I said, I think I've highlighted precisely the sort of hypocrisy that's been going on from the left. Uh, the, the government, I must admit, you know, they, they go to the wall to defend their ministers. Uh, they ha- they're they not quick to sack people in that sense. So I'm surprised, if you like, at making my own forecast. But reading the signals coming out from number 10, it doesn't sound like they are going to appoint him. I'm afraid that is the age that we are living in now. Uh, and we shall see how that emerges. But if I could just briefly um, change the subject, although it is linked, how refreshing it was to see um, uh, the BBC uh, new new leader come out uh, today. I think who is trying to um, trying to uh, uh, quash some of these uh, habits that are growing up at the yes. moment that um, that a lot of us find very distasteful. I think it's extraordinarily refreshing, uh, and I'm sorry his name's just slipped. Tim Davy. I think it's. Tim Davy, I yeah. found it extraordinarily refreshing yesterday uh, that he's essentially saying to all those broadcasters and newscasters uh, on the BBC, uh, which is is meant to be impartial, he's basically saying to, to those who are putting out this highly impartial partial social media uh, tweets, blogs, etc. That, that they're putting out. He's saying, "Hey, the party's over for you guys yeah. uh, and ladies." Uh, he says, "Because um, I don't want to see any more of that. The party is over for them for a very simple reason. Whilst they've been happy to uh, put these uh, very impartial posts out, and they are influential people, they are doing it whilst they take the public money mm. uh, from the very people." that they actually seem to despise in their tweets and social media postings. And it's right that he's called them out on this. The test for him will be if he actually does something about it, if these people Mm. continue uh, to flout his requests. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, I'm actually about to support this guy, Tim Davey. He seems to be the first Mm. person at the BBC uh, to have seen sense because at the beginning of this week, uh, they reversed that ridiculous decision not to have uh, anybody singing Land of Hope and Glory at the last night of the proms and rule Britannia. Now, not only uh, have they moved away from not playing it at all uh, to playing an instrumental version, they're now going to actually have a choir inside the Albert Hall. Now, a lot of people have said, oh yeah, that's all very totemic and it really doesn't matter. But it actually does matter because it was for a lot of people, the final straw of why the BBC somehow needs to change. And if he's smart enough and clever enough to do it just for the purposes of self uh, sort of preservation, I don't really mind as long as he does it. And you're absolutely right. You know, if Gary Lineker is told not to tweet anything political and then does, what does he do then? Does he fire him? Well, th- I get the sense that uh, he's um, he's come out really. This is his main platform. He's just spelt out literally almost on his first day in office, mm. if you like. It would be very foolish of him to row back on it. Uh, and I have no sense uh, that he will. And I think people will respect that. I think they will respect his wider plan for the BBC. He is talking about a streamlined BBC. Let's not forget, putting aside what some of these... Um, people get up to with their very impartial opinions being funded uh, as uh, uh, sending those out at the same time they take the money from for the public money from the very people that they seem to despise mm. let us let us also remember he's talking about streamlining the bbc looking at areas where frankly the bbc are state subsidized to such a degree that it makes it difficult for independent competitors mm. to compete with them yes uh, and i th- i think he's essentially saying if there's channels and areas we're not in or that don't draw uh, draw make a useful contribution we won't be in them my yeah. goodness how refreshing is that it's he really- could be the guy who saves the BBC. Well, isn't it funny how, while everything else is sort of going to hell in a handcart, as it were, the BBC suddenly found, as I've said to Julia Hartley Brewer, the cupboard of common sense that they've been hiding under the stairs for about 30 years, uh, and they've suddenly worked out that they can, uh, if they wish, not act as they have been for the the last, sort of, at least four years anyway. 
Well, except he will find huge institutional resistance to what he is trying to do. Remember, um, this is true of, of, of ministers. Uh, they come into government, they are absolutely convinced of what they want to do. They have a clear agenda and some of them are tough cookies. Mm. But there can be huge, as we've seen in the past, for goodness sake, Brexit with Theresa May, let's be honest. Um, it was a huge institutional resistance to things. So the one thing Tim Davey will need above all, above, above his plans and his ideas is stamina. He is going to need the stamina to take on the vested interests that will not like what he is doing so that he can shake up that institution and I believe ultimately save that institution. And as we move through September, Nick, obviously Boris Johnson, uh, he had his big meeting uh, yesterday with backbench MPs. He, they, they've asked mm. for more leadership um, as ever. People seem to be focusing on how many people there were in the actual room, which I don't think really matters that much. But as far as um, his next two weeks go, uh, what do you expect him to do? Is he going to come out and make some changes? I don't believe that we're going to see substantive government changes uh, until we come out of the EU, i.e. a January reshuffle. Mm, yeah. It just doesn't make sense. I think he's got enough on his plate. There's always the watching brief on COVID where they will be devoting huge bandwidth to. But he's also facing this critical time in the Brexit talks. And really refreshing about Boris Johnson, something I never saw when I was in government, uh, is that he, has, he understands that the key issue that is stopping these uh, talks progress, i.e. that the EU want to keep us on board with their uh, rules on state subsidies, on their so-called levelling playing field, he understands that our future competitiveness, particularly in emerging industries where he wants to plough government money in to get them here in Britain, and get them started, these new technological businesses of the future. He understands that the EU is trying to bind UK's hand so that we cannot become more competitive and be a large economy on their doorstep, which would be so competitive, they would not welcome it. That is why they are digging in as they are doing. And I am so pleased that Boris Johnson seems to understand that this is the one thing he should not give ground on. And if he doesn't, and it means we exit the, uh, the, uh, the, the talks without a deal, so be it, because it, will be, it, it won't be easy, but our real future, the future of our younger generations, the future workforce depends on us being able to structure and rebalance our economy as we wish to do it without having our hand tied by artificial state subsidies to please bureaucrats in Brussels. Indeed. Nick, very well said. Thank you very much indeed. Nick Desoir, former Conservative MP, author of Confessions of a Recovering MP as well. Uh, we're going to take some calls coming up very shortly because we want to hear the voices of common sense, which are, of course, coming from you uh, out there in the independent republic of Mike Graham. We're live streaming on YouTube. Get on that now. Live streaming on Facebook and Twitter as well. 0344 499 1000. This is Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Talk Radio. The Independent Republic of Mike Graham on Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk Radio. Lots going on. We're going to be speaking later on uh, in the show to the chief executive at Heathrow Airport, a man uh, who feels very strongly about the fact that this quarantine business that we are currently in uh, is going to be the death not only of the travel business, of the airport business, but also of airlines uh, and, of course, of trade as well. Because how ridiculous is it that if you fly back into Heathrow from Portugal, you do not have to quarantine. If you fly back into Cardiff or Glasgow from Portugal, you do. It doesn't really make very much sense to me. It doesn't make very much sense to him. John Holland Cade will be with us just after midday. Uh, don't forget, we have the return of the Perry Rewards today as well. Right now, though, uh, let's get some news headlines with Ross Powell. Talk Radio. Half Hour Headlines. The Transport Secretary Grant Shapps has told Talk Radio that an increase in testing for coronavirus in Portugal is the reason it's been left off England's quarantine list. If you only look at the number of cases, uh, what you're in danger of doing is penalising or punishing countries who do the right thing and just carry out a lot of tests in order to find them. Uh, and what we found with Portugal, for example, is the percentage has actually fallen this week. 
Those returning from Wales, however, need to self-isolate for two weeks from today, while the same rule will apply in Scotland from tomorrow. The government is being urged to work with unions on a new job protection and upskilling scheme to help avoid a huge rise of unemployment this autumn. The TUC has warned ministers not to throw away the good work of the job retention scheme. Meanwhile, new analysis shows more than 400 deaths involving COVID-19 occurred each day in UK care homes at the height of the pandemic. The PA News Agency has analysed figures which show more than 3,000 care home deaths involving coronavirus happened in one week alone loan in mid-April. Number 10 is facing growing calls to drop the former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott as a choice for a top trade job following criticism of his reported homophobic views. Labour MPs Chris Bryant and Wes Streeting have accused the Health Secretary of hypocrisy after he tweeted about the fantastic new LGBT inclusive relationships and sex education in schools. And work officially begins on the controversial HS2 rail line today. The project was given the green light to continue early this year but has been dogged by delays. Ministers believe it will create 22,000 and jobs. A look at the weather, a wet start for parts of Scotland this morning, but the majority of England should be dry and bright. Some wet weather creeping into the southwest in the afternoon, highs of 19 in the southeast. Ian Collins, weekday afternoons from 1 on Talk Radio. Join me, Ian Collins, weekdays from 1 pm. And not just the latest news and breaking stories, but analysis from every angle. Ian Collins. I promise you, this is like no other current affairs programme out there. Weekday afternoons from 1 on Talk Radio. Mid morning with Mike Graham. Talk Radio. The Independent Republic of Mike Graham on Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk Radio. One of the things that we love to do here uh, at Talk Radio is to hear the voices of the people uh, because we care what you think. And we're going to take some calls right now. 0344 499 1000 is the number. Phil uh, is in Milton Keynes. Hi, Phil. Good morning, Mike. Morning, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your contribution, your campaign to get this Royal Britannia back. I think you have single-handedly made that happen. You really have. Thank you. If it wasn't for you, you know, the BBC and Sky and all the other blasted uh, pro things, we, would, we, we still wouldn't have it. Oh, yeah, they were all piling in saying what a good idea it was to forget about it altogether and never, ever play it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, anyway, but the, the reason I, I really wanted to ring, uh, Mike, was on a positive... I want to give an injection of positivity to everyone... And in particular, to anyone in the Conservative Party, I know there's a lot of uh, influential uh, MPs that, um, for the Conservatives that listen to this show, and I would ask any of those that have an ear, um, that uh, have an ear with Boris Johnson, mm. to say this, you know, it's, there's a lot of good science out there. So stop looking at the negative science and look at the positive science. We know there was all that big horde of people on the Bournemouth beach, all these mass thousands of people over the BLM marches yes. clustering together, and all the other numerous marches. And there's been no ill effect from that. So that is good science. He can quote that and use that. We need to be now thinking, yes, there's been all these top, um, we've, we've increased 300,000 tests a day. And what it's proving is that people that are carrying the, 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 the virus, mm. that is a good thing. That yeah. is, this is what we need to be saying. It's a good thing because it's proving that the nation has now uh, gained herd immunity. Right. Look, the 90, 90, probably 6%, 97%, 98% possibly of the nation won't be affected by this. OK, there will be a few that will get, you know, perhaps the worst, a bit of bad flu. And we know there are still vulnerable people. Yeah. But that's a separate issue. Yeah, you well, know, we heard, I mean, did we not hear last month that more people died from regular flu than did actually die from COVID-19? Indeed. I mean, there's so much more, you know, I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a, a massive um, uh, outbreak of gonorrhea, for God's sake. You know, there's all sorts of that... nasty things that are going around. Right. And we would always get these things. But uh, what I would like to say is that Boris Johnson, the language he should be using to say to the people, listen, you know, we, this is good news. We, we, we're now proving that we have got herd immunity. Let's get back to work. And what he should be saying, instead of giving all these wretched updates about, oh, so many thousand, mm. you know, uh, people affected, instead of doing that, forget all that nonsense, he should be saying to the people, right, all those people who are getting back to work, at the end of the week, he should be giving an update and saying, well, thank you very much, nation, for all the people who have gone back to work, because you people who have gone back to work, you have increased our GDP by £10 billion this week, right. and given an update every damn weekend, yeah. um, and, and saying this is what you've contributed, and actually saying basically you're shaming the people who are not going back. 
by that message. Well, I I'll tell you what, is, I, I, here's a question for you, Phil. How is it possible yeah. for 100 million meals to have been eaten by people Indeed. thanks to the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, uh, but yet nobody can come back to work because it's too scary? Exactly. I mean, it's, it's a nonsense. Right. I mean, we just need to get a think of reality check. And Boris Johnson needs to get a bit, a bit of backbone. You know, this was a guy that people elected who, uh, who, who says, I, you know, can do, will do. Mm. Where is that, or where, where is that spirit gone? You know, we want a bulldog spirit and start telling the nation, you know, we're British. We have got the fighting spirit. We've got the guts. We can do things. You know, we can make things happen. That's what he, that's the sort of... Yep. Very well said. Very well said, Phil. What a great call. Thank you very much for uh, kicking us off this morning. Phil and Milton Keynes uh, saying, yeah, forget about all this negativity. So I've been saying this for months, right? I've been saying... Actually, since last year, when everybody was really depressed about the fact that Brexit was going nowhere, the fact that we were stuck in the mud uh, in Westminster, stalemate city, couldn't get anything done, couldn't get anything through. Suddenly, Boris Johnson called an election and made it happen, right? He needs to get that back, that mojo that he had then, Bojo's mojo, if you like. He needs to get it back. Let's talk to Daniel in Epsom. Hi, Daniel. Morning, Chief. How are you doing? Very well, sir. Bojo's mojo. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely think that this, this Conservative Party needs to start acting like the big C, tough Conservative government we want. Yes. What and you I, voted I for. Need, we did. And we, they need to come, come up uh, and they need to do big and strong things like we want them to. Mm. Um, I'm ringing up to stick up for Tony Abbott because right. I saw Kay Burley interview the health minister the other day and it was an utter car crash of an interview. I cannot wait for that right-sided news channel to be launched. Honestly, I, I just can't watch the news. Yeah. And she was calling him a misogynist and all sorts. And I was, I was sat there thinking to myself, how many men in Australia or in Britain in their mid to late 70s throughout their entire life haven't said something that by today's standards right. would, would seem a bit risque? But also, but also, it. Daniel, I was thinking about this on the way in this morning, right? You know, he's being described as somebody who is against gay marriage, right? Although his, one of his former staffers says that he's got a sister who's actually gay. So, one, I don't even know if that's true. But two... Um, you know, it's not against the law to be against it. You can have a reason. You can be a conservative. You can be a traditional conservative and, and not be in favour of it. You know, I'm, I personally don't care who wants to marry who. It doesn't make any difference to me. But they shouldn't be demonising someone for having traditional views, should they? Yeah, but that's what they do now. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, not just, it's not just him. It's across the board. Yeah. I mean, the, the names they'd probably call you, Mike. You know, I, I wouldn't like to... Well, I, you can just have a look on my Twitter. You can see what they call me. <laughs> I've come off of it. It's almost like a bit of a sex <laughs> Right. But, um, but the thing is, I, I, I look at it, and they, 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 there are a band of people in this country on the left that will take offence and make a mountain out of a molehill everywhere. And, and how, how many men, as I say, in the 70s haven't said something in their lives that now we wouldn't say? I right. mean, I can remember things people said when I was a kid. I'm 43. Sure. And you wouldn't say them, you wouldn't say them now. Yes. Uh, I just think to hold, to hold people's history to account by today's standards is wrong. Yeah, it is. But also, even if, for example, the person who said it then is still saying it now, you know, it's a it's an opinion. You know, we don't want to have this whole kind of vanilla world where everybody has the same opinion. And if you don't have that opinion, then there must be something wrong with you. You know, what's wrong with having a different opinion? Yeah, there isn't anything wrong. I think you, the other day, what sort of trade envoys do we want? Do we want someone who's lived a life and spoke his mind and you know, where's his heart on his sleeve? Or do we want someone who's a little shrinking violet yeah. and agrees, agrees with the people right. left? I mean, you want a guy like Tony Abbott to, to get up in, in, in a meeting and say, well, if that's the best you've got, I'm leaving. And that's the kind yeah, of guy he is. And that's the guy you want. Uh, mate, on the ground, this is what I'm saying. Uh, talking about being real conservatives in the government we want, this is what we want. Mm. We want trade of, trade invoices who behave like that. We want our government to rule with, a, you know, the law and order in this country is out of control. Immigration's out of control. We want the economy concentrated on those three issues should be at, at the forefront. I don't want to hear about any, the environment. I don't want to hear about anything else until those three issues are sorted. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Dan. You think you speak for an awful lot of people as well who voted for this particular Conservative government, gave Boris Johnson an 80-seat majority, uh, which has been whittled down to 79, by the way, which everybody likes to point out. But, you know, they do need to fulfil their mandate. That's what I think. Let's talk to Kevin, who's in North Yorkshire. Hi, Kevin. Hello there, mate. Hey, for not at all. How are you doing, man? I'm fine. I just wanted to sort of say that uh, with regard to the BBC, I think at the end of the day, we don't need to slack off with these people. I think the only reason that, that, that the DG is, uh, is saying the things he's saying at the moment is because of people like yourself. And I think these people, 
that these institutions are hard grained, ingrained with this leftist mentality, yeah. and it isn't going to go away overnight. Right. And if we take our foot off the pedal with these people, then um, they're just being political. They're just saying the thing. They're seeing the effects of, of, of what's happening with with people's opinions, and they're, they're pondering to it. But it's not going to change their opinions no. underneath. No, it's not. But but it's going to make them less able to, to, to spread those opinions because they'll have to do it by way of working somewhere else. And that's fair enough. Well, that's true. But I think at the end of the day, I think what we need to be pushing for is they can be as left as they want if they were an organisation that was paying paying for it through advertising. Yeah. If, we, if they want to cut free and be a lefty organisation, let them do it. Let them float on the market like everybody else. Yeah, let them go work for The Guardian where they have to beg for money every single day of the week because they haven't got any. Exactly, and I think that's why we don't need to take our foot off the gas with these people. I think at the end of the day, that they need to scrap the license. We need to get rid of that organisation as it stands. And if they want to be a lefty organisation, then let them be that. But yeah. um, you know, at least it would give some room then for somebody to come through with some middle ground and some common sense, like your good selves. Yes, absolutely right. Thank you, Kevin. Very well said. And we will certainly keep the foot on the pedal. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, the amount of pressure that we were putting on, and that you people uh, who listen to talk radio and who listen and are members of the Independent Republican Mike Graham put pressure on them as well. And they realised, and there is an opportunity here because they have got a new director general. There is an opportunity for him to start off on the right foot and to start doing the right thing. And it seems as though he's beginning to do that. We'll talk about that some more coming up uh, in the next hour, of course. Coming up next, though, we're going to talk to Dr. David Lloyd, GP uh, at the Ridgeway Surgery, because schools are back this week, which is a good thing. Uh, but already some schools in England have sent pupils home to self-isolate already uh, after a couple of days because they've been diagnosed as having COVID-19. We'll find out whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, how it's all going. If you're a parent, I'd love to hear uh, what it's like for you with your kids going back to school and how they're feeling about it, because there's a lot of mask wearing going on there's a lot of sort of social distancing going on in the corridors and we need to know how the system is actually working 0344 499 1000 is the number don't forget we're live streaming on youtube uh, we're on facebook we're on twitter as well get on it watch us subscribe to us you'll get all sorts of great things including of course plank of the week this is talk radio across the uk online on dab and on your smart speaker talk radio talk radio Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk Radio. Some interesting stories that have appeared in the papers this morning. We'll get to these later. Facebook is aiding people smugglers, claims Pretty Patel. Uh, apparently Facebook, since about 2016, has been running all sorts of pages uh, in which you can sign up to and sign on to and follow yourself and follow uh, where the people traffickers are, where they're going to take you to, where you're going to go next, how you're going to get some money. Uh, it's quite an insidious situation. We're trying to figure out uh, how that's going on. Uh, we'll bring you more on that as we can. Right now, though, let's talk to Dr. David Lloyd, who is, of course, uh, GP at the Ridgeway Surgery. Interesting times at the moment because, obviously, the government tried to get people back into work, but government tried to get people back onto public transport. People are reluctant to do so. However, 100 million meals have been sold uh, to people who took advantage of the uh, Eat Out to Help Out uh, campaign, which tells you that people aren't scared to go to restaurants. But schools are back as well. But we've heard already that primary and secondary schools in Greater Manchester, Yorkshire, Leicestershire, Lancashire and Buckinghamshire uh, have all been stricken by coronavirus and have sent some kids home. Just seven at the moment. But let's find out from Dr Lloyd uh, whether he's worried about that. David, a very good morning to you. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks very much. No, not at all. Um, I mean, I suppose this was inevitable and I suppose we shouldn't make too much of it because I've been saying for a long time when uh, when we can, uh, we should probably just get used to having this virus around rather than sort of running away from it and shutting down entire schools. Well, I think that this is. I think this is. A, I mean, I mean, you know, when you rang me, it was just. A, these are just two things. I mean, there's a, a whole crowd of people arrived back from Greece, and they weren't self isolating, mm. uh, and so they've all tested positive. And that's a, that's something we do know is that when you get large groups of people who aren't self isolating or using a mask, then you're going to get these breakouts. So that's one issue that's about today's news. The other is about schools. And yes, I quite agree with it. We've got to get children back to school. Uh, and their risk of transmitting the virus, if, if the, the national rates are low, is pretty low. But when you get these people who just don't obey the rules and you get these breakouts, then that's the worry. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because I was talking to a caller just before uh, before this who was talking about all the people that went to Bournemouth Beach and all the people that went on those Black Lives Marches, uh, marches uh, Black Lives Matter marches, rather, um, and not much seemed to come from that. So it's not every single kind of uh, collection of people, perhaps not social distancing, or maybe they were doing more social distancing than we knew. 
I, I don't know. You look at the pictures today and they weren't social distancing at all. They were right. all stark naked and jumping all over each other, which, you know, for young people is tremendously exciting. I remember the days. It was good fun. But <laughs> Those stars, were the days. <laughs> they were the days. But uh, I, 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 in these day and age, you've just got to be careful because mm. you're not talking about yourself, are you? You're talking about your grandmother, your grandfather. You're talking about the person who's got the chronic disease that might just get COVID and not do very well. Well, I suppose so. But then again, as I say, we're going to have to have that sort of hanging over us, I think, for, for quite a long time, aren't we? So so it's really... It's a so massive... if you're going to do that, then you must be, obey the rules. Yes, that's right. So we're going to have it for a long time. We're going to have to get used to social distancing, wearing a mask, washing our hands mm. until we get the vaccine. And then when we get the vaccine, please tell everybody on your radio to have the vaccine done. Mm. Don't get any of these anti-vaxxers on your radio and getting airtime saying that it's a useless vaccine. Well, listen, I I, I, I'm, not, I'm not somebody who's in favour of the anti-vaxxers, but but I, oh, I'm also not in favour of <laughs> I'm also not in favour of censorship. I'm more in favour of getting them on and telling them to stop talking absolute and utter nonsense. But um, yes, but in the ratio in the ratio of good to bad, they 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 are they only percent should get a percentage of your life. Yes, no, quite. I agree with that. But I think the other problem for us is is that we're dealing with situations which have previously been unknown. Like, for example, I mean, my kids are going back to school next week. Um, yep. One of them is going to go to an FE college um, because there's no sixth form at his school. So he's going in for one week and then being home for one week and they're sort of alternating it that yeah. way. The yeah. other is a much more traditional secondary school where they're isolating each year um, and sort of bringing people in every day, but they're not yeah. mixing with other years. And I guess we yeah. won't know if that's going to work for a while, will we? I, I, I'm from, I mean, I'm hearing from lots of different schools in my area about different systems. Parents are having to pick up their children at different times, different sorts of bubbles, different sorts of form splitting. I think over the next few months, we'll get an idea about what is the best system. Mm. But there are lots of different systems on the process at the moment. Yes. Uh, and we've just got to watch these R rates and just worry. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the schools that we were mentioning earlier, where seven people have been sent home, yeah. I suppose that we, you would expect a bit of that, wouldn't you? Well, if they all go to Greece on a plane and don't isolate, yes, and that's what they seem to have done. <laughs> well, I mean that's true, but I mean, would we? I mean, are we saying that that's the, those are going to be that those are the only ones, and if nobody else has been doing that, then you'll be fine. Well, at, at the moment, if in in the area in the, in in England, that the rates are low, right. and so hopefully by taking these precautions, we will keep the rates low, and and let's have a quiet winter. Yeah, sure. As I've said before, the. The evidence from Australia is very encouraging. They, they, they've had their winter, and in the last six months, they would have expected 383 deaths from flu, and in fact, they've only had 35. Mm. So the distancing measures are not only very good at keeping COVID at bay, they're also very good at keeping the flu out, and they're stopping the viruses. So you're, we know the systems work. Mm. And so in one respect, us GPs, we might actually have a quieter winter in terms of the common old garden virus, as we see, purely because of the social distancing and the masks. And if that works, then heavens, we should be able to keep COVID at bay as well. Well, quite. They're all viruses and they all work the same way in that respect. And what are you feeling about the testing situation at the moment? Because there seems to be a variety of uh, kind of different views on whether there's any point in testing people at airports. There's a lot of pressure building now from the yeah. airline industry, uh, from the yeah. travel industry. We're going to be speaking to yeah. the chief executive at Heathrow later on in this show um, because they would rather a different method of somehow control which 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 is something other than quarantine, which which is. I, I must say, from a, from a purely, I mean, I'm not a world expert, but I think the test. I think I agree with the airlines. Let's have a testing situation. I have patients flying off who get tested, but before they go by their airline, yeah. when they arrive and their and their destination, they're tested as well, and they get a test back quickly, and they're told whether they can go out and about. Mm. I think that sh should be the, a much better system than these corridors and quarantines. Yes, my it's got to be. My isn't son, it? who's a doctor, got trapped in Spain and had to ourself I lose over two weeks so you know it's a personal thing well now we've got this crazy system whereby if you come back from Portugal to Scotland you've got a quarantine but if you come back to England you haven't yes absolutely it's the way you interpret the data isn't it it's yeah. a very interesting way I mean it, it's a it's a terribly difficult thing yes I, I agree I think we should have more well on the on the comp process on testing yes the more tests the better yes anybody who gets the fever or feels unwell should be able to get a test without having to 
a hundred miles yeah. or whatever. It and is. do you have any any fears or doubts about the eff- efficacy of these tests or the, or the efficiency yes. of them? Constantly, I worry myself constantly about them, and especially the ones where, where I mean, I use, I see the videos of people having the swabs taken, and they're t- they're t- some of them are being taken entirely wrong. You have to do a brain biopsy to get a proper test. You've got to get that swab right to the back of your nose, right to the very base of the brain to get the virus. And so you've got to do the swab properly. Yeah, exactly right. And as far as you know, um, aside from the, the groups that you've described who, who perhaps were not doing what they should have been doing and therefore have got uh, infected with COVID-19, um, yeah. generally speaking, um, colleagues of yours that I speak to in the medical business, particularly GPs, tell me that they haven't had very many cases recently and they believe that the virus is definitely on the wane, not to say that it's disappeared altogether, but that it's definitely not as virulent as it was. Well, I, yeah, yes, but if you look, if you go to the European website and look at the cases, I mean, look at look at France, for instance, for instance, sudden shoot up, and that must be due to the fact that, you know, as you know, the French all go on holiday simultaneously in August, uh, and all dashed for the south of France, uh, and that's why they're getting their uptick. So, th- this virus is not going away. We've got to be there, and we've got to be vigilant, and we mustn't forget those terrible times of March, April, May, and June when ITUs are full people were dying like flies it can happen again yeah well it's not happened for a long time and so let's hope it doesn't happen again david thank you very <laughs> much a long time. <laughs> well it hasn't happened for months has it yes yeah, like, yeah, but in the old days we used to talk about years yeah well we're not talking about years though are we We are talking yeah, about we are talking about a massive difference i mean in terms of the numbers of people dying there were thousands of people dying then every day now yeah. there's about 13 yeah, but it won't take a month for things to ramp up again. Mm. Well, we shall see. Hopefully you'll be wrong about that. Dr David Lloyd, thank you, GP at the Ridgeway Surgery. A lot more cautious than many people that we've spoken to uh, over recent times. But uh, if you've got kids going back to school, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear whether the measures that are in place are satisfactory uh, or indeed whether they are even necessary. And what you think about that, 0344 499 is the number. Coming up, uh, we're going to be talking about a great many other things, including, of course, the BBC, because... Because guess what? The new BBC Director General, a guy by the name of Tim Davey, is going to get a thumbs up from me. Now, you might find that slightly surprising. And I'm sure people who work for the BBC who consider me to be the enemy uh, will be quite upset by the fact that I think what he's proposing is rather a clever idea. He's basically saying that he doesn't want anyone who works for the BBC to be in any way political. He doesn't want them mouthing off on Twitter. So think about Emily Maitlis. Think about Gary Lineker. Think about Laura Kunzberg. Think about Lewis Goodall. All the people that we uh, basically have a go at and who find themselves on Plank of the Week on a regular basis. He doesn't want them working for the BBC if that's what they want to do. I think that's quite interesting. Let's talk to Peter in Southampton. Hi, Peter. Hello, Michael. How are you doing? Lovely to speak to you. Very nice to speak to you. What can I do for you? Uh, what it is, I found out that the government, well, it was on the internet, that the government are running a consultation at the moment to change the law to uh, roll that, so that if they feel that it's uh, appropriate and it's safe to uh, unlo- unlicense vaccines. Right. When you say unlicense, what does that mean? Well, that means it hasn't gone through the full procedure to be licensed. It's like drugs are licensed. Right. Well, because they're rushing but- it through, you mean? Yes, yes, basically. Right. And you're worried about that? Very concerned. Mm. Well, I think a lot of people are. I mean, I'm not sure that there will be a vaccine in a a reasonably quick enough time for everybody to think that that will be the answer. And the reason, of course, that doctors will say to everybody, please get vaccinated, is because if if the bulk of people don't get vaccinated, then it doesn't really work. No, that's correct. But And another thing is vaccines don't work with the old. It, it's not one fits all policy at the end of the day. Yeah. But the way the government are putting this through mm. and they're, they're wanting uh, G, uh, the GPs, they want in the chemists, so and so to be able to administrate the actual vaccine, which yeah. seems very irresponsible. For, for the way that they're pushing this, to be quite honest with you. And well, I wouldn't, you I wouldn't saying, be so worried about a, a pharmacist giving you a vaccine rather than a doctor. I mean, pharmacists do an awful lot of things now that, that doctors used to do alone. But now, because they can't handle all the business, they get pharmacists to do it as well. Well, it wasn't just the pharmacists. They were on about the tra- track and trace. There, there is an actual bit in there. It, it's on the NHS website. It's mm. a consultation, and it's going to the 18th of this month. Right. So it, I'd, I'd advise people to have a little look okay. and make their own mind up on what they actually believe. But sure. I think 
Well, well, you know, for yourself, it takes anything up to eight years for a vaccine to be properly put through all the tests and everything. Well, I don't know that. I mean, to be honest, I'm not much of an expert on vaccines. But I mean, what I can say is that you're quite right to say people should make up their own minds. But I mean, I'm not particularly concerned about it. I just I just don't believe they're going to get a vaccine within the next year or so, which is going to be worth a fag in. I just don't know whether they will. If they do, great. But I'm not sure if they will. But that's the problem. If, if they feel that the vaccine, because they've spent so much money on these vaccines, yeah. Mike, at the end of the day, he's rolled, well, hundreds and hundreds of millions mm. they're spending. Yeah. So if they actually, their scientists, believe that, oh, this is safe for us, but if they believe it's safe, then it should be licensed. Yeah. But then they're saying that they can un, they can roll it out to us, which is, like I say, very, very irresponsible and very yeah. scary as okay. far as I'm concerned. Well, I don't think they're going to be vaccinating people with something which is dangerous. I mean, I just don't see what would be the point of doing that. But Peter, thanks very much indeed. Got to run. Uh, coming up to the news uh, at 11 o'clock. We've got the BBC to talk about. We've got Heathrow Airport to talk about as well. Uh, we'll keep taking your calls on all manner of things. 0344 499 1000 is the number. This is Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk Radio. The BBC, eh? The week started out pretty well. You might remember we were waving union flags here on the Independent Republic of Mike Graham after the BBC's new director general uh, basically completely and utterly reversed an earlier decision don't forget this is what they wanted to do for last night of the proms they wanted to do away with land of hope and glory they wanted to do away with rural britannia they didn't want to play the music at all uh, they mentioned something about undertones of racism undertones of a remarkable connection to slavery they got it wrong on both counts by the way because neither one of those songs has a connection to slavery however there was such a big backlash led i have to say uh, by this show by this radio station and by all of you listeners out there who were outraged by this not because it's totemic not because it doesn't mean anything not because in fact rural britannia uh, is just something that we shouldn't be taking too seriously but because it was almost the final straw the final ignominy the final kind of insult to our traditions in this country and I think the BBC have seen now the error of their ways. They've appointed a new Director General, a bloke by the name of Tim Davey. Now I didn't hold out much hope for this guy. I thought, here comes another middle class, middle aged white guy uh, who's going to be a champagne socialist, who's going to be a left winger, uh, who's going to think that all of the things that the BBC has been doing lately have been brilliant. You know, ever since the uh, referendum which took us out of the European Union. It's a great idea for Laura Kunzberg to have a go at anything that the Tory government says. It's a great idea for Lewis Goodall uh, to write pieces for the New Statesman, the left-wing Bible, about what's going wrong with the government. It's a great idea for Gary Lineker, the host of Match of the Day, uh, to talk about how he's going to be getting an asylum seeker into his house and how, you know, we're all racist in this country and how basically we should all be doing an awful lot better because he says so. Well, quite frankly, the fact that this guy Tim Davey has now decided that that's all wrong and that, in fact, he should be telling these people to sit down and shut up. Emily Maitlis from Newsnight included. I think can't be a bad thing, can it? 0344 499 1000. Coming up, James Price, former government special advisor, uh, is going to join us. It was his take uh, on the new BBC. Uh, I'm going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he's onto something. He's also talking about shutting bits of it down, which is what I've been suggesting for quite a long time. 0344 499 1000. You're listening to me, Mike Graham, right here on the fastest growing radio station on the planet. It is, of course... Talk Radio. Mid-morning with Mike Graham. Talk Radio. So even The Guardian has picked up this story today. The new Director General of the BBC is to crack down on staff posting their views on social media in a move to restore the view of the broadcaster as impartial. And yesterday, he raised the question of slashing the corporation's output by a fifth, cutting more jobs and potentially shutting down TV channels. Well, listen... I'm all in favour of that. They've got 10 TV channels at the BBC, believe it or not. Let's find out now from James Price whether I am barking up the wrong tree, whether I'm just barking because I've now suddenly found myself in favour of the BBC's Director General. James, a very good morning to you. Hi there. It's great to be here visa-free into your independent republic. (laughs) Welcome. You're absolutely right. Uh, We've uh, we've spoken a couple of times before, James. Tell me, um, I'm quite surprised and slightly taken aback that this this guy Tim Davey has become so aggressively anti-BBC in his first few days. I know. Well, as Diane Abbott would say, even a stopped clock is right three times a day. Um, I think it's it's wonderful news to see that the BBC might be finally going back to its original founding charter, yeah. which we all apparently have forgotten to inform, educate and entertain. 
Um, it doesn't say anywhere in that founding charter that you should go on to Newsnight and go on kind of these long political screeds or worse to go on to Twitter and do it. Or in the case of Lewis Goodall, who I think you just mentioned, to get a front page splash on the New Statesman talking about how terrible the government is. Yes. It's tough uh, to make a cat laugh. Well, it really is. I mean, the beginning of the slide, I suppose, was the real Britannia b- uh, b- business at the beginning of this week where uh, he announced that they were going to not only play the real Britannia and, and Land of Hope and Glory songs, but actually they were going to get somebody to sing it, which they previously told us they couldn't do because of the COVID epidemic. I think it's it's almost like a perfect storm. I'm very glad that this kind of horrendous thing around the, the problems actually happened because it's got such huge cut through to the normal people in this country of thinking, hang on a minute, maybe people like you and I going on about the BBC had a point and they finally realised quite how far the rot has set in the place. Mm. Um, and it's also coincided with uh, with Lord Hall, a man who I think joined the BBC in the 70s straight out of university and was there almost all the way through his whole career until a brief sojourn at the Royal Opera House before coming back to be the Director General has left and this new chap has come in and it frankly seems like a breath of massive fresh air that's definitely needed. Well, it really does. But I wonder, uh, and Nick de Bras said this to me earlier, whether it's going to be actually effective because there's going to be a challenge, I'm sure, coming from those uh, who like to proselytise on social media like uh, Laura Kunzberg, although she's been quite quiet recently, people have noticed. Lewis Goodall uh, is still out there. He was moaning and groaning about the... uh, the possible introduction of a right-wing news channel, as was Nick Robinson, who was kind of entreating people uh, the other day to make sure they wrote to Ofcom to stop this channel from ever getting underway. You can't be allowed to have people think independent thoughts, right? No, absolutely. Um, I think think that the rot is set quite deep and quite a long way, and I don't think until very recently, really, probably Brexit, that it's been at those top political levels. Mm. I actually think that Kunzberg is pretty good. I think she's probably about the best there is. But people like Goodall and Maitlis, they just can't seem to help themselves. Mm. I think that it's it's those times when finally when MPs feel finally obliged to have to come and weigh into this with threats of legislation or changes to the licence fee model. I think more iniquitous are all these sorts of these social norms that get pushed around. So you had a lot of, uh, of things like uh, videos of how not to be a Karen yes. in the wake of all this. Uh, this what is, you know, it's now basically just misogyny to go and calling people Karens if women like to complain about things Um, and and all those sorts of social things more than it is necessarily most of the time someone going on the radio and saying Tories are bad yeah it's all the rest of it and telling us what we ought to think and that we're backwards in the rest of the country not London if we don't believe what people in the BBC think I mean I don't mind being told Tories are bad uh, on radio (laughs) stations I don't mind watching Question Time what I object to is the fact that they pretend that all of this is completely normal behaviour and in fact the person who's telling you Tories are bad is not just somebody with a a left-wing perspective it's somebody who has studied the science almost you know it's like they know the Tories are bad because look at what they've done there's no possible other explanation for it It's it's like the whole Tony Abbott hysteria that's going at the moment you know oh my goodness me what somebody's actually got some conservative traditional values therefore they must be the devil right i've got i've got lots of colleagues who who would take a different stance to this and they see these sorts of i guess we'd have to call them culture war arguments coming up now mm. and feel compelled to defend the bbc because they have you know the people who work there have a valid point of view and it should be debated but that's exactly the problem the bbc should be this kind of neutral arbiter it shouldn't be uh, weighing in on all these kinds of things it shouldn't have to become a political issue you know i'm not saying that you and lawrence fox need to take over presenting bake off although we Actually, probably did a pretty a good idea. job of it, to be not honest. Not a bad idea. Yeah. Or, or Farage going and, and running Strictly Come Dancing or anything, right? You just yeah. want a level playing field with these things, especially, by the way, when you still got the threat of imprisonment if you don't pay this well, incredibly outdated licence Well, that's the other thing. I mean, Strictly Come Dancing, for me, uh, is a commercial enterprise which should be produced by an outside broadcast company outside of the BBC. Uh, let them make money or let them stand or fall uh, by the commercial aspects of its success. But what I object to about the BBC, and I particularly find this objectionable in their local radio output is that they completely stop anybody else from operating uh, a commercial business in broadcast because they can't compete because they don't have to to make ends meet they don't ever have to be profitable they don't ever have to worry about the ratings all they do is survive on this free cushion of money provided by us Absolutely. And you've hit the nail on it exactly right there. Any one of your listeners or or people watching this live on YouTube, if they've seen that their local newspapers have gone from being weekly, sorry, daily to weekly, Mm. and now maybe even to only online, that's been massively hastened by the fact that that the BBC has spread its tentacles all the way out across the country and does all these sorts of local news things. Regional radio suffers, as you say, local papers suffer. So I think we've now got to a situation where either the BBC has to move to a sort of subscription model and lets itself go and compete against Netflix and against everything else, 
or it gets massively trimmed back into just doing some of its core functions. And that's presenting news in a hopefully objective way, but also to be fair, making really interesting programs that may not be commercially um, viable. Yeah. Strictly definitely is. There's, there's all sorts of crap they used to have, like can fat teams hunt, right? Or any of those sorts of rubbish programs mm. that you might find on some minor channel. But the BBC doesn't need to make that. It should make interesting and informative things, but it doesn't need to make all this kind of lowest common denominator stuff. No. It should focus on keeping the national conversation going. Exactly right. And it needs to be far better run because there's no doubt that Tim Davies had a look at it. He's talking about getting rid of 900 people. He won't even touch the sides. I mean, it won't make any difference at all to the fact that uh, there'll still be another 9,000 working in the same building from which the 900 have gone. And I mean, the number of times you go to an event when I was a reporter back in the day um, and you would find about 15 reporters from various different BBC outfits um, and you'd be working for three newspapers, you know, because that's the commercial world in which we live. And they just can't carry on like that. It's ridiculous. No, I used to get it as a special advisor. You'd have multiple people from across the BBC would all text you asking about the same story. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my old gaff at the Taxpayers Alliance used to have a lot of fun working out just for the top stars how many licence fees, you know, Gary Lineker was worth. <laughs> and it's it's astronomical. Yes. And that's before, by the way, some of the really cheeky ones who, who make themselves these sorts of private companies and then get paid off books and paid much, much more. Right. Uh, again, Gary Lineker, I'm sure, can be paid an absolute fortune to talk about football on Sky or, or somewhere else. I don't quite understand why we're threatening old ladies with the threat of prison well, for not paying for his salary. Well, believe it or not, guess what? He already does that, you know, because somehow his incredibly lucrative contract with the BBC also allows him to go and work for BT Sport. Um, so we're not even getting the best of both worlds. You know, I actually think Gary Lineker uh, is not a bad presenter, even though he's blocked me on Twitter, so I can't actually interact with him <laughs> because I once asked him whether he was paying any tax on his Walker's Chris income. He didn't like answering that. <laughs> Apparently. But I mean, the bottom line for me. Can't imagine why. No, I know. It's ridiculous. But still, he's taking a refugee soon, so that'll be fine. But, the, but you know, the bottom line is, is that will he adhere to this? Because of all of the people um, that we've talked about, including Emily Maitlis and, and, and uh, Laura Kunzberg, all of the Amal Rajan as well has been pretty quiet, apparently, on uh, on Twitter. Lewis Goodall is probably a coward, so we'll probably buckle under. But the fact that, um, that Lineker is quite full of himself, he may take the view that he's going to challenge this, right? And so he'll put out a tweet. And then it will be down to Tim Davey to see what he has to do about that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, that, and that will, this kind of shake up will always encourage that sort of challenge. Um, and whether it's from someone like Gary Lineker who goes mouthing off or whether it's any, if there's any real attempts at sort of structural change inside that building, how mm. it will be frustrated. I think that that TV show they do about themselves, W1A, is yeah. actually quite funny. But it's not it's not enough to go, <laughs> aren't we silly? Don't we waste lots of money yeah. in stupid, pointless meetings right. and then do nothing about it? Yeah, um, it's just ridiculous. Well, one of my and, favorite and sort of, uh, one of my favorite illustrations of how useless the BBC is as an organization for actual administration was when they moved everybody up to Salford and Radio 5 Live had to sort of relocate up to Salford. They were bringing guests from London to Salford and. Um, on trains, they were putting guests up in hotels. So they actually, you know, all of this moving out to the suburbs and the, and the, and the different parts of the country was completely and utterly pointless because they ended up costing uh, about four times as much. Mike, I'm ashamed to say that I, I took one of those trains I'm once sure you and did. I stayed in the hotel. I'm it was sure perfectly did. lovely. I spent the next morning on BBC Breakfast and doing all the radio stations. It was great. And then I got a, someone got me a taxi back to the, the station, back to London, who was sat next to me, but one of the BBC Breakfast presenters. <laughs> well, I can tell you exactly who that was because I know that story. Um, and she used to come back to London every single day uh, and take her child from school and then get back on another train, go back up there, stay the night in another hotel. I mean, it was just profligate. You'd never get away with it, even in the most kind of generous of private companies maybe that's why the bbc is still so pro hs2 because it gets them back and forth <laughs> towards Salford a bit more quickly well absolutely right but i mean in terms of the actual political um uh, end game here i suppose i mean boris johnson hasn't made any great secret of his uh, of his uh, enmity with the bbc and i don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that come 2027 there will not be um a license fee in the same manner as there is now no, I think that's right. And I think that, that a lot of being made of the way that Number 10 is is sort of dealing its media relations, um, where, not just the BBC, but with, with Piers Morgan's breakfast show. Mm. Um, Piers Morgan can't seem to understand why it is that ministers don't want to go on and be shouted at for 10 minutes right. at six o'clock in the morning. It doesn't sound that much fun to me either. Um, I think that there is a big change coming. I mean, not to be too sycophantic, but talk radio is growing massively. It is. Because it's an alternative voice to these sorts of things. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, also, because, I used to... it's also because we actually listen to what ordinary people have got to say, because ordinary people, I think... I never catch sick, on. Uh, ordinary people are sick to death of watching 
very, very well-paid presenters having a go at uh, the people that run the government, rightly or wrongly, because they don't get a say in that. They don't get to say, well, what about us? What questions can we ask? You know, why aren't you asking the questions that we want you to ask instead of just shouting at them? Well, exactly. In, in my old job, I sort of felt compelled to listen to the Today programme on, on BBC Four in the morning um, because you'd think that was the thing that all the politicians listen to right. and, the, and the big journalists and all this sort of stuff. And then you get to a point where they start talking about some tiny obscure issue of some, I don't know, some metropolitan little museum somewhere yeah. or other that gets a footfall of about 10 people a month um, and, and totally ignore huge issues that are going on anywhere else. Yeah. And it's well, ridiculous. You know what's and funny no wonder is people are turning over. One of the times when the Radio 4's Today programme was at its most relevant was when Rod Liddell was the editor of it. Now, Rod Liddell, as everybody knows, is now considered to be a sort of right-wing polemicist, writes a column in The Sun, a column in The Sunday Times, writes The Spectator, very clever guy quite right wing, but was able to be the editor of a very, very straightforward news programme. And he did it very well. And there was no bias at all. Right. And as, as much as I actually am I'm warming to my own idea of you and, and Lawrence Fox running <laughs> uh, the Bake Off show, we're not asking for that, right? I think what, what most people would like to see is for politics to retreat from all areas of life. Yeah. It's become incredibly existential, mostly uh, the reaction against the Brexit vote and perhaps the fact that the, the prospect of Jeremy Corbyn as prime minister was so terrifying, certainly to some people in our society, Jewish people in particular, who were thinking about fleeing the country. Mm. We're glad that that's not the case anymore. We're glad that Brexit is almost not an issue. Well, get over coronavirus too, and that will hopefully not be an issue. And then we can stop having to worry about politics all the time. But that's only really going to happen when we can stop worrying about the BBC politicising things. But I really believe there is a kind of insidious left-wing um, kind of program where they're trying to make politics about life, where they're trying to make life about politics, where they're trying to basically say that, you know, if you've, your views are on the right, then clearly you're a bad person. You're a horrible individual. You're the sort of person that shouldn't be left alone uh, with anybody who might be damaged by your terrible, terrible words. Right. However, um, everybody who is on the left is great and they're very, very uh, sensitive and they're very nice. I mean, I was hearing this conversation uh, on a show the other day about whether somebody was sensitive or not. And it was all about whether women are better leaders than men because they're more sensitive. And it's like, what are you talking about? Why is sensitivity suddenly an issue for people being in politics? Right. I mean, you can see, I think, over one of my ears, there's maybe a cushion with Mrs. Thatcher's face on it. I'm not <laughs> sure she was worried about being sensitive. She was worried about doing a good job. Exactly. Um, but it's not just the BBC, right? You, this kind of insidious creep of, of this way of thinking has infected most institutions. And it's because lefties have read their Gramsci, who talked about having the long march through the institutions mm. and have progressively taken over mostly universities. But you see it in the church. You're seeing it in, in the police, frankly. You're seeing it in all these sorts of organ- civil service as well. Completely. Uh, and I think it's time that there is a, a, a move against that. Again, not to make everybody a kind of mad free marketeer like I am, but just to have some level of balance and a level playing field to actually discuss the ideas. I'm yeah. sure there's even something I'm wrong about and that some lefty can help me get better with. Yeah. You need to be able to have that conversation. It. But the point is, is the difference between the left and the right, it seems to me, is that the left want you to be like them. You quite like them not being like you. That's the difference, isn't it? Yeah, I had I had a curry with a couple of mates last night, one of whom is, I think, planning on being a Labour MP one day. He's probably going to be called an awful Blairite or something at the moment. Right. But we had a lovely conversation, some of it about politics. Then you move on and you talk about more important things like sport or something. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be everything in everybody's life all of the time anymore. No, it really doesn't. James, really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much indeed. Very enjoyable conversation. James Price, former government special advisor, now at Hanover Communications. The bottom line is, surely, um, the BBC is bloated. Uh, it's overfilled with people that shouldn't be there. Um, it is certainly uh, doing things that it shouldn't be doing. And I think this new guy, Tim Davey, actually might be onto something. I think he's discovered um, that actually let's be the voice of the people. They can't now be the voice of the people, of course, because that's what we are. We've taken that mantle uh, and we are growing literally by the hour, never mind by the day. And the reason for that is because we let you give us your views and we care what your views are and we uh, put them out there for you. So we want to take more of them, please. 0344 499 1000. Don't forget, uh, we are live streaming on YouTube, on Twitter and on Facebook. So make sure you're looking at us as well as listening to us. This is Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk Radio. I've got to read you this, right, because it's a very, very ridiculous sort of sign of our times. Dan uh, has sent me this, which was originally tweeted out by somebody called Claire. Um, And it's basically one of those... um, 
um, TripAdvisor type reports on something that somebody did and they reviewed it, right? Because you know how now everybody reviews everything that they do. And this was somebody who went to climb Ben Nevis, which if you don't know, is a mountain in Scotland, right? This was almost a full day's climbing, uh, says this reviewer. And my girlfriend was crying at one point. When we did get to the top, there was nothing there. Mount Snowden has a pub and a restaurant and toilets at the top. Luckily, we had brought some sandwiches and drinks, so anyone else climbing this one, be warned, there are no facilities at the top. It's a mountain, right? People climb mountains. They don't expect to climb mountains and find a McDonald's at the top of it. The climb basically went on for far too long. And get this, the last part was particularly steep and difficult. <laughs> it's a mountain, OK? Uh, it was also cloudy at the top. So the view was non-existent. OK, it's a mountain in Scotland where they quite often have a lot of clouds. The final one, uh, the long, the final sentence, the long walk back down was boring and again took far too long. <laughs> this is these, these are the kind of people that are reading The Guardian. I don't know what they're doing, but for God's sake, if you want to climb up Ben Nevis, you're going to have to expect it might take a while. It might be quite steep. It's a mountain. There isn't a pub at the top of it. And you're going to have to come back down. It might take a while. Other than that, I don't know what to tell you. John is in Essex. Hello, John. Oh, hi. How are you doing? Um, oh, I'm fine, thank you. And how are you? Yeah, very well, sir. What can, yeah, you, what can I do for you? We've before. We have. Really, it's, similar, uh, it's much on the same topic. You yeah. spoke to Dr. Wood again today. He, yes. His delivery is very quiet and measured. Yes. But I disagree with his opinions. He's not mad as He's fact. quite pessimistic, isn't he? Well, uh, you took the words out of my mouth. I yeah. really w was about to, to use that very word. Mm. Um, he came up with the idea, oh, we could, uh, we're all terrified of a second wave. I'll remind you of that. I said, well, no, he didn't include me in the we. Right. And people will get the impression that maybe he speaks for the whole profession. Well, he does not. No, he doesn't. No, because no. as I said to him, I've got many doctors who I speak to on this show who tell yeah. me that they believe... There won't be a second wave. Yes. And in fact, the uh, disease and the virus have become a lot weaker. Well, in fact, that's it. I mean, the obvious fact, and you will have heard this from Johan Giesecke, who I believe was on the radio this morning, and I missed him, sadly, um, which is surprising that the BBC took him on. Perhaps this is Tim Davis' effect already. I right. think he was on the Today programme. I just caught, caught the tail end of what he had to say. Well, the bottom line, John, as you know, is, is that you can always find people to say almost anything Absolutely. if you want to, you know? I mean, we don't we don't vet people that come onto this show no. in the sense of what they're about. I mean, we ask them what they're going to talk about. We don't ask them what they're going to say. And certainly, I wasn't keen on his idea of censoring people. Well, it, it, it's a delight. Your attitude is lovely, and I must say, you amuse me very greatly with the uh, climbing. Of climbing Ben Nevis. Nevis. Can you imagine that there are people out there who actually <laughs> complain that a mountain is steep? Really. <laughs> Yeah, well, you've got the delightful mix of entertainment and information. One other little bit of information <laughs> I wanted to put over is this, that um, he's ignoring the one enormous fact. The disease has gone simply because it's run out of susceptible objects. Mm. There are no really people left to catch it. Yes. That's why the... I mean, they don't parade these statistics on the BBC every day. I think there were 10 deaths yesterday. Right. Every day, there are 30 deaths from carcinoma of the prostate. They mm. don't put those figures up every day, scaring the wits out of people. No. There are a similar number of carcinoma of the, the breast deaths, and they don't put those figures up. But the number of susceptible people left is so low that it can't reach them. Yes. What we don't know is how long the immunity lasts, but that's the reason for the wave-like structure of every flu. But also, yes, and I've said this to you before, John, that yeah. what we need are the figures of people who are infected who are being hospitalised and who are going into hospital. I don't think there are any. Almost none. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, he came up quite obliquely, but he did, oh, you could be a granny killer, you know, um, you could pass it on to someone else. Well, I am a great-grandfather. Yes. I'm not in the least worried about it. Mm. I am, as you know, back in practice, even well yes. in my 90th year. I know. And I've seen patients here. It doesn't bother me. I may or may not have caught it. Um, I had a mild episode in the uh, spring of a fever, but I didn't get myself tested. Right. And that was the end of it. Right. But, um, well, you're a very sensible man, John, and I appreciate your call once again. I've got to run, though, because we're slightly behind the eight ball for time. Uh, but thank you for your call, as ever. Do keep making those calls, because we do need the voices of common sense, like John from Essex, uh, who counter sometimes some of the rather scaremongery type words that we hear from some people in our medical profession. Now, I'm not saying you can't believe what the doctors say, 
But you can also find doctors who will tell you exactly what John just said, and he's a doctor himself, by the way, uh, that, uh, you know, this the, the, the virus is definitely on the wane. 0344 499 1000 uh, is the number. Kevin O'Sullivan coming up next. Let's get some news headlines first with Ross Powell. Talk Radio. Half Hour Headlines. Despite calls from the aviation industry to introduce coronavirus testing at airport terminals, the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps has told Talk Radio the idea won't work. It's not supported by the science. If you test people on day zero when they return at the airport, bearing in mind this um, virus has a 14-day incubation period, um, the the sciences, the medical sciences, you probably only pick up 7% of people who might actually be carrying the virus. This as Welsh holidaymakers will now need to quarantine for two weeks as they return from Portugal. Those returning from Scotland will have to do the same from tomorrow. Downing Street is facing growing calls to drop former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott as a choice for a top trade job following criticism of his reported homophobic and misogynistic views. Labour MPs Chris Bryant and Wes Streeting have accused the Health Secretary of hypocrisy after he tweeted about the fantastic new LGBT inclusive relationships education in schools. The UK could be facing shortages of goods in shops within months if issues at the borders aren't addressed before the Brexit transition period ends. Eleven industry groups have written to, to the Prime Minister demanding a meeting, warning there are gaps in the government's plans. And seven police officers have been suspended over the death of a black man in New York State in March. Footage released this week shows the group restraining Daniel Prude, who died of asphyxiation. There have been widespread protests in the US over police brutality and racial inequality following the death of George Floyd and the shooting of Jacob Blake. A look at the weather, a wet start for parts of Scotland this morning, but the majority of England should stay dry and bright. Some wet weather creeping into the southwest in the afternoon. Highs of 19 in the southeast. Talk Radio, your trusted 24-hour resource for breaking news and non-stop conversation. We very much hope that this may be a turning point for the government. Unparalleled radio for unprecedented times. It's all very well and good to say yeah, public health must come first, but at the same time, you, you can travel in a way that doesn't put people at risk. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Mid-morning with Mike Graham. Talk Radio. The independent republic of Mike Graham. On Talk Radio. Gaz has tweeted in uh, apropos that uh, review of the Ben Nevis, the mountain, uh, saying the madness of 2020 cued the cancelling of Ben Nevis. Well, good luck cancelling an entire mountain, but you never know. I mean, this is what the lefties will try and do. Let's talk to Kevin O'Sullivan, uh, our man uh, in the uh, outside broadcast tent. Uh, he's not here at the moment, but he will be here tomorrow from 10 o'clock and Sunday as well. Kevin, very good morning to you. Hi, Mike. I was just uh, amusing myself with this review of the mountain, Ben Nevis, climbing the, the Ben Nevis mountain. Apparently it's very steep at the top. Uh, and the bloke who was climbing it was complaining about that. Uh, yeah, well, we should cancel that mounting right away. Just <laughs> Immediately. Now, you've had another uh, interesting week covering for James Well. James made a brief appearance the other night as well. Um, so good to see that. Um, how's it been for you? Uh, well, it's been a great week. Uh, uh, you know, there's so much going on at the moment. Uh, as you've been talking about all, uh, all of this show and for half the week, this new director general of the BBC is a very interesting character. He smacks to me of a guy who's been sitting there for years watching the nonsense going on and saying, I can't wait to get hold of this organization mm. and sort it out. So far, the signs are very, very good. Uh, but what, you know, he's reinstated the lyrics of Land of Hope and Glory and Royal Britannia. Uh, but what will he do in the long term? I mean, what is he going to do about? News night. It's all very well saying that Lewis Goodall and Emily Maitlis and Gary Lineker will no longer be able to put out their political tweets. Mm. But what's he going to do about that show? That entire show is like one great long biased tweet. Yeah. So he's got to sort that out. What worries me about him, although he's putting out the right messages, uh, turning the BBC around is like turning an, a super tanker around. It's going to be very difficult to get that organisation on side because right now I guarantee you there are thousands out of the 22,000 or so who work for the BBC who will be plotting to ruin Tim Davies' uh, common sense project. Well, they're not going to take it lying down, are they? And I wonder uh, how easy it's going to be for him if he doesn't have enough sort of lieutenants to push it through. But, I mean, you and I have been in journalism a long time, Kevin. You've worked in television, you've worked in newspapers, you're now working radio. You know, you know perfectly well how to fix Newsnight. Just give them a decent producer and a decent editor and not somebody who's, you know, uh, sucking from the teat of the Guardian. And basically, uh, you'll get a much better programme, you'll get a much more balanced programme, as I was saying earlier uh, to our, our guest James Price. 
you know, when t- when the Today programme was at its height, it was being edited by Rod Little, right, who didn't in any way affect the, the political leanings of the show. It was just very well journalistically done. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, but the point is, yes, you, you know, I would suggest a root and branch change of Newsnight's staff because the setup now is all wrong. It's a, like a party political broadcast on behalf of the Labour Party, and that has to end. Uh, will Tim Davies have the resolve and the guts to do it? That's another question. Uh, he's either a guy who really is going to save the BBC, so far the signs are good, or he's a guy who's a clever guy who knows to, what to say at this difficult time for them in order to get through these instant, immediate uh, choppy waters. Mm. Uh, and then after they get through those, will he just relax and go back to the old bad BBC mm. that we've come to know and hate? I mean, it's now time to say, look, I mean, the BBC won't accept this, but we have to say his predecessor, Tony Hall, was one long, massive disaster, right up until his final ludicrous mm. decision to go along with axing the lyrics to two favourite patriotic songs at the last night of the proms. What a disaster mm. that man was. Uh, Tim Davy has to do a lot of work to put right the wrongs that have gone before him. Yeah, exactly right. Because also the final kind of ignominy uh, was when Sir Tony Hall left, uh, or Lord Hall, I think it is now, uh, left Lord the Hall BBC. Birkenhead. Of Birkenhead. Of he actually said um, that the BBC needed more money, not less money, in order to continue to become the voice of the people post-Brexit. And you're kind of going, you have no idea what you're even talking about. Because what he meant by that, clearly, was the voice of the Ramonas. Yeah, and you've got to be very careful about this. This is what uh, we must monitor Tom, Tim Davy uh, about very closely, uh, the licence fee. The licence fee has to go. The BBC is now already talking about, oh, right, well, the licence fee might go, but we'll get our money by taxing everybody extra. They're even talking about putting money on people's council tax to pay for the BBC. No, no, no. Pay for yourself. Pay for yourself. We're sick of paying for you. Uh Make yourself more sensitive. If you, if the BBC was in the commercial sector, it would never have been as mad as it is now. So the age of us paying for a state broadcaster has to come to an end. It's anachronistic. It's like something out of another age. And the idea that you can be sent to prison for not paying for television entertainment is just grotesque, mm. strange, weird. You wouldn't get it in the worst despot dictatorship. So why on earth is it happening here? All this has to end. The licence fee has to go. The BBC has to look after itself. Quite right too. And I'm sure you'll be touching upon um, the, the sort of the, the, the empty streets and the, uh, the unbusy buildings of London and various other parts of the world. I was watching uh, with interest a story this morning in The Guardian where they say that 100 million uh, meals have been eaten by the uh, Eat Out to Help out uh, scheme right so 100 million meals are safe but going back to an office and on a train isn't apparently yeah there are so many people let's uh, not beat about the bush here there are so many millions of people right now are lying about the fact they fear for their safety yeah. what they're doing is they've had four months holiday they want the holiday to continue as you and i mike have said for now for weeks maybe months Working from home will not work. It has to end. Uh, we have to get back to the old normal. No new normal, the old normal. When we had the old normal, this country was doing very nicely, thank you. Uh, now we're talking about the new normal. We have a conservative government that's acting like a socialist government. And all this is wrong. We have to get back to work. The kids are going back to school. You and I have discussed the absolute scandal of them having to wear face masks mm. when they've got no chance of catching this disease. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, that's a new normal. It all We have to get back to the old normal and we need a government to start acting as if this pandemic is coming to an end rather than quivering and saying, yeah, but what if it comes back? <laughs> it's ridiculous the lead we're getting from Boris at the moment. No, exactly right. And what about guest-wise? What have you got coming up for us tomorrow? I've uh, got Jimmy Doherty coming on. Uh, he's going to try and save Britain's bees. Uh, the human beings of Britain are an endangered species at the moment, but bees are in even worse trouble. So he's got a TV show coming on about that. Adrian Smith of Iron Maiden, yep. heavy rocker, has written a book. Uh, you'll never guess what it's about. Uh, is it about sex and drugs and rock and roll? 
Uh, no, it's about his love of fishing. <laughs> so we're going we're to see uh, another side of the wild man of rock. Uh, your friend of mine on Sunday, Carol Decker's coming on. Excellent. To review the papers. Uh, and Nigel Marvin, my favourite TV naturalist, is going to come on and tell us all about the mysterious sex life of the eel. So, sex, drugs, rock and roll, we got it all. It sounds fantastic. Kevin O'Sullivan, thank you very much. I should look forward to listening. Kevin, uh, on from uh, Saturday at 10 o'clock until 1 in this very slot, and also Sunday uh, as well from 10. Loads going on on his show, loads more going on on our show as well. Ian Collins coming up, of course, at 1 o'clock. Coming up next, we'll take more of your calls. I've got another one of these reviews of another mountain, which I can't quite... This must be a spoof, surely. Surely it's a spoof. For heaven's sake, 0344 499 1000. This one's about Snowden. This is Talk Radio. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Let's go straight to the phones. If you want to join in, of course, you know what the number is 0344 499 1000. Natasha uh, is in Salisbury. Hi, Natasha. Hi, Mike. How Hello. You doing? What can I'm I do for you? Well, thank you. Right. Okay. So um, I'm back to work. I'm running a, a screening clinic. I, I ultrasound um, screen men for um, aneurysms. Okay. And um, all my patients so far this morning, uh, the age group we deal with is 65 plus. So mm. they're a sort of, you know, a slightly at risk group. Yeah. Um, they've all said this morning they are heartily sick of having to wear masks, having to social distance can we please just get back to normal? Mm. And these are elderly people who are sick and tired of being, you know, treated in this way that we, we all have to go around wearing masks. Mm. And so, so these would I be just, people who would otherwise be sort of what you might regard as vulnerable to COVID-19. In, in theory. I mean, some of them are absolutely amazing. You know, you look at them and you wouldn't have any idea that they were 65 plus. Right. But then, you know, you get other people who are sort of in mobility scooters and, and you know, clearly they've got sort of underlying morbidities. But yes. they're, they're sort of fine. And I mean... My father's just had his 97th birthday. He's out at the pub. Mm. As he was out loads when it was eat out to help <laughs> right. out. And though the first day that the pubs reopened, I went out with my sister, and um, there was an elderly chap in there with his oxygen cylinder and his nasal cannula, um, busy out having a meal. Right. I mean, I think people just, the government just don't seem to see what normal people... Well, this is the trouble, isn't it? Because, again, we're split into sort of two different groups, it seems to me, in this country. The sensible, common-sense-driven people like yourself and the people you're talking about, and also uh, the others who are telling us, oh, well, we're going to work from home because we're too frightened to go back on a train. And you kind of go, well, why are you too frightened? I mean, um... I don't think it's right to blame the government for scaring everybody because, yes, that may have been the case back in March and April, but not now. No, well, my daughter's 20. She's worked, I mean, she's a student, but obviously she wasn't at university while the lockdown. She's been in a supermarket all right. through the lockdown. Right. You know, she's out there she's doing stuff. I mean, it's just a joke. Um, the other thing I just quickly wanted to touch on, if I may, sure. is this business about Tony Abbott. So um, as a woman, mm. I obviously, according to the left, should be up in arms because he's apparently a misogynist. Right. Um, give the guy the job. Well, you know, according to the you, woman who was uh, working for him, who was on Julie Hartley Brewer's show this morning, she said, "Would you think? Do you really think that as an intelligent modern woman, I would work for a man who was a misogynist?" And that was a great point. I thought. Yeah, very good. I mean, and I would just add to that that um, a few weeks ago I did uh, ring in and say to you that I feel the Conservatives don't really understand what conservatism conservatism mm. means yeah. anymore. If they if they back down because of left-wing opinion and don't give this man the job because they're too frightened to stand up to them you know they've really lost they it. really have no i totally agree really and i was have. really disappointed actually to hear nick dubois even say that he thought that's what they would do i find that it's extraordinary shocking. i know i mean it just seems that cancel immediately so uh tony abbott get the job mm. all right mike I know. Let's let's face it, Natasha, you and I are in the same boat together. We should continue to fight them on the beaches, is all I can say. Natasha, with a great call. I'm going to talk to Chris. Let me just read you this first before we go any further. And this is a tweet that's coming from Liz, who says, how about this? It's a review of Snowden, uh, even though they do have a cafe and licensed premises on the top. Now, this is from somebody uh, who gives their name as Addy the Great. This mountain is so steep, it's wet, it's cold and miserable. Surely the local council can plant some trees or something to protect climbers from the wind on the way up, or at the very least, dig away at the rock and make it straighter. Also, there is no signal, so I couldn't live stream or Snapchat or Facebook my journey, which was the whole point of climbing up there in the first place. I mean, really? 
And then he says, don't bother. The date of the visit, December 2019. Quite surprised that in Snowdonia, it's wet, cold and miserable in December. I mean, for God's sake. Pass the sick bag. Uh, let's talk to Chris in Colchester. Hello, Chris. Hiya. How are you doing? Um, yeah, not bad. You all right? I'm good. I, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder whether these are all spoofs. They can't surely they can be people be. actually out there that think like that, can they? I hope not, but it wouldn't surprise these me. These will be the same uh, people that don't want to come back to work. Probably, yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> what can I do the, you for? Well, yeah, no, um, the, the doctor was quite worrying, actually, the, the what he was saying. I mean... Um, I think we should always remember that swine flu, uh, the swine flu vaccine caused damages and uh, there had to be damages paid by the government because children had narcolepsy from mm. it. So it's not like vaccines good, vaccines bad kind of thing. You know, it's uh, we've got to have some nuance here. Sure. There's, uh, you well, know, that's right. Yeah. I mean, if you want to vaccin vaccinate people, you've got to give them the, the, the possibility uh, and, and the, sh the surety that it's going to be safe. Yeah, and I think there is uh, the pharmaceutical industry is is quite powerful, and they, I don't think they want to harm people. They just not, you know, they no. don't want to have that worry. They, no, I think as it, ever, Chris, the, the the common sense position is in the middle, isn't it? You're not going to go, yeah. oh, the government are trying to kill me by vaccinating me. That's not happening. But also, no. uh, you don't want them to get it done so quickly that it's not safe. Exactly. Yeah, but um, and also, yeah, with what I'm worried about is it might be the government policy and certainly some people is trying to get this mass testing thing going. Mm. And uh, we've seen a lot of examples that testing isn't reliable. There, there was a study or uh, from New York or uh, in America saying up to 90% of, um, of the, the testing is like that 90 people tested positive, that they haven't got enough of the virus to spread it. Right. Uh, that was in the mail. So, and then there's false positives, false negatives. Yeah. So testing isn't always reliable. So, you know, I'm, I'm like probably a lot of people, I just want to get back to, to without these crazy rules. And I think the government needs to get rid of them. And uh, we have to drop this fear um, because it's it's affecting everyone mentally as well. And the lockdown caused more damage than good. And, um, yeah, I, it's just gone on yeah. too long. And No, I think you're right. I mean, the only thing yeah. I would say about the testing thing is if that can make things easier, i.e. they can mean that people don't have to quarantine, then I would be in favour of that because, yes... The system isn't perfect, but the system of locking people down for 14 days just because they've been somewhere where there isn't much of an infection is bonkers, isn't it? Yeah, and again, like you picked up earlier, that um, we're we're focusing on cases now. It's become a case demic, yeah, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean symptoms. So it that that, that that's the trouble. Yes. Like you said, there's the hospitalizations and deaths are down to basically nothing. So mm. we shouldn't ignore that and. Uh, obviously if it does come back in the winter then we can be careful again can't we yeah exactly right and i think we can adapt and and, and comply um, and do things that need to be done if they need to be done good call chris thank you in colchester let's talk to les uh, who's in the west midlands oh les oh hello, hello. how are you doing I'm OK, sir, yeah. Very yeah. good. Great to talk to you. I just wanted to tell you about the BBC licence fee. Yes. Um, I object th th to paying the fee, um, and the reason is because uh, for people that only watch, uh, for example, Sky Sports, mm. uh, they still have to pay a BBC licence fee. Yes. And, and that's wrong. If it was the other way around, you know, if, if I mean, I don't watch much Sky... Well, I do a little bit, but not much. But... but but some people aren't interested in sports at all. Right. Uh, and if, if they watch the BBC and had to pay a Sky Sports subscription, uh, there'd be riots on the street. I mean, that's, Well, exactly. It, yeah, but, it, yeah. I mean, it's such a ridiculously old-fashioned method of, of, of raising yeah. money. Sure. And also, the fact that it's compulsory is disgraceful, in, in my view, that you actually, as Kevin O'Sullivan said, you can actually go to prison yeah. for not... It's the only tax that you have to pay that you will immediately go to prison for if you don't pay it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So potentially there might be somebody in prison today, might be listening to this show on yeah. in jail, uh, that has never watched the BBC ever. And, right. You know, uh, and, and that is not right. It's, no. it's, it's, it's not, it's not um, a, a BBC licence fee, it's a TV licence fee, and that, that's just crazy. Well, exactly, because if you don't have a licence fee, you can listen to BBC Radio, and I think they could be much more um, sort of... Uh, I don't know, well nuanced by charging for different parts of what they do and then they could find out which parts of it are actually popular and they could do away with the bits that aren't popular. Yeah, yeah. Makes perfect I'm... sense. I don't know how you and I can work this out in a three-minute phone call, Les, but the BBC, it takes about 100 years. Let's talk to Chris, who's in Wokingham. Hello, Chris. Morning, Mike. How are you? Very well indeed. How's the Pizza Express down there? 
Um, yeah, quiet. Is it? <laughs> Very quiet, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, never, you never know what, you, what you're going to find down there if you pop in. What can I do for you? Okay. Um, just really wanted to pick up on a couple of things that David Lloyd said um, earlier. Because, yeah. you know, I've been watching him with interest um, on um, Good Morning Britain, um, where he buddies up to peers and, um, and all of the scaremongering. You know, he, he actually said that all the social distancing in Australia um, has actually managed to reduce flu deaths in their flu season to 35 deaths. Mm. Um, but on average, you know, 380 people, I think he said, died of flu in Australia each year. Yes. Um, well, Australia is currently recording something like 780 COVID deaths. Um, you know, so... Right. And also... Well, in, in total? Uh, in total, Is yeah. that all? In twen- yeah. It's not many, and is in it? 20... And in 2017, they had a bad bout of flu and 1,160-odd people died. Mm. So, you know, I don't have an A-level in biology, but I do have an A-level in maths, and, uh, you know, I can work that out. Right, exactly. But so why have they got a curfew on in Victoria, which means people can't even go outside uh, after 8 o'clock? I I honestly don't know. I I mean, it tells you that the whole world has kind of caught this particular madness, isn't it? It it certainly does. And, you know, know, moving on to another point that some of your other callers have been mentioning, you know, this government urging people to get back to work... Mm. Um, you know, I've, I've got a friend who works for um, a, a high street bank um, in commercial banking. Yeah. Um, but, you know, she works for one of the, the big names in banking in an office with about uh, 4,000 people. Um, under current government guidelines, they're only allowed 20% of their staff in right. you know, due to social distancing. So, right. you know, it's one thing for this, this government to be saying get back to work. But, you know, no, no big corporate company is going to actually go against government guidelines. No and get all of their staff back. No, that's true. I mean, it's interesting because I think there are ways of getting more people into uh, into buildings because, as again, people learn how this is going and they realise it's going to take a lot longer than they thought. I think they're going to have to be a bit more creative because it's one thing to go, OK, um, like, for example, in this building, um, only people sitting next to each other is allowed. You can't sit opposite anybody else, even though there's a screen in between, and that presumably is a, is a government guideline. But you can also then put the desks behind each other instead of facing each other. So, I mean, there are ways around it, but, but yeah, I mean, I take, I take your point. I mean, if you're running a big company, why should you do something the government tells you to do, even though they're making it difficult for you to do it? Exactly, and yeah. you know, and these people are all itching to get back in, even if it's only for two or three days a week. Right. Well, I mean, that would be a start, you know, and I just think yeah. the government needs to be more proactive. It needs to be maybe slightly less draconian about how it's done. Um, because let's face it, most people that I speak to, and I don't know about you, but most people that I speak to are not worried about going on a train. They're not worried about going out for lunch. They're not worried about working uh, in an environment where there are other people. And, and if they are worried, then fine. You can have, you can make a case and you can probably tell your employer that you really feel uncomfortable about coming in. But I suspect that's a very small number. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, yesterday we had um, the governor of the Bank of England saying that, you know, people need to get out and spend money and that mm. sort of thing. Well, no one's going to go spending money in the high street or, or in a pub or a restaurant at the moment because it's such an awful experience. Well, no, but 100 million meals were served, according to uh, the, the figures I've got today, on this Eat Out to, to Help Out scheme. That's a lot of people and a lot it of is. restaurants. It is, but, you know, that's just because people are being chucked money to go and eat out. Yeah, but you just they? told me they're frightened to do it or they don't like doing it. I mean, it's not a great experience. I was out last night for this, only the second dinner that I've been to mm. since the lockdown uh, started in March, right? And the restaurant is a lovely restaurant. The food's beautiful. Um, it was um, at, at Cyrus Tony Waller's place in East London, you know, the, uh, the curry mm-hmm. house. And it was brilliant. Yeah. But there was only five tables occupied. And so yeah. it's not the same as it was. But exactly, you, I think yeah. you still have to do it because we are duty bound to keep these guys going. Because I thought to myself, you know, what have they done to deserve this? It's really tough for them. No, you're absolutely right. You know, I've, I've got um, a, a pub over the road from me where, um, you know, it's a private landlord. He, he's not uh, linked to any brewery or anything. Yeah. And we go over and support him. You know, it'd be much cheaper to, to sit in and drink at home. Sure. But, you know, I'll, I'll go over there and I'll take my wife and kids because he's uh, he's got outside spaces. Yeah. And, and we go over and spend money to support them. But, uh you know, I, I, I'm not going to go and sit in a restaurant and be served my food by someone wearing a mask. Well, OK, that's fair enough. But, I mean, I was, and that's still helping them out. So, you know, you've got to pay your money, it takes your choice in a way. Chris, thanks very much to do for your call, though. We've got to run. Uh, lots more to do, many more of you to talk to. Uh, 0344 499 1000. We're going to talk a bit more about getting back to work, getting Britain back to, to normal. John Holland K uh, coming up in the next hour. He's the CEO of Heathrow Airport. He's written a big piece in the Daily Mail today, which says the UK is being strangled and our rivals are stealing our business. 
So it's a very serious state of affairs right now. It's not just me saying, get back to work, populate your offices, get back in the restaurants, get back in the pubs. It's got to be done. Otherwise, you don't know where this is all going to end. This is Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Good afternoon and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk Radio. We've been talking about a great many things this morning, including, of course, the need for the cities of this country to get back to normal. We're going to talk in this hour to John Holland Kay, the CEO of Heathrow Airport. He's written a piece in the Mail this morning in which he says the UK is being strangled. Uh, the quarantine system, which is now in place, is not doing the business of travel any good, but it's also not doing the business of trade any good either. Uh, there's jobs being lost. There's business being lost. There's people whose livelihoods depend upon tourism uh, getting absolutely nowhere at the moment. London uh, is a dead zone for most parts of it because there is no tourism, which we to, which we really rely upon in massive ways uh, in order to keep the economy of this country going. Uh, we're going to get figures uh, from John Holland Kay about exactly how much business Heathrow is losing. Because don't forget, Heathrow is not just a hub for passengers. It is a hub for all manner of things. Smoked salmon. Uh, it's a hub for people flying all over the world on business. And I know there's not much of that being done right now, but there does need to be, surely, some Somebody getting to grips with all of this and saying it's all very well, as we just spoke to our last caller, saying get back into work, get back to the office. But if the office regulations are such that you cannot go back to work because your organisation tells you you can't, then what are we left to do? 0344 499 1000 is the number. Don't forget the Perry Awards coming up a little bit later on. A bit of homeschooling as well. You're listening to me, Mike Graham, on the fastest growing radio station on the planet. It is, of course, Talk Radio. Mid-morning with Mike Graham. Talk Radio. Let's say hello now to John Holland Kay, Chief Executive at Heathrow Airport, a man uh, who, alongside many other businessmen and business leaders, has got together uh, to express massive amounts of concern to the government about where we go from here. John, a very good uh, afternoon to you. Welcome. Afternoon, Mike. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. I mean, I've been banging on about the need for, um, you know, proper economic um, sort of activity to to begin and to get going. And it's not really good enough to keep hearing from people. Oh, I like working from home. Everything's fine. I see more of my kids. I don't have to commute. You know, the trains are still empty. Uh, The airports are still empty. What can we do? uh, And what can you do to get the government to kind of take more uh, initiative here? Well, I think so far the government has been focused on the issue in front of them, which is the health crisis. And we all understand that none of us wants to see a second wave of infection here in the UK. But increasingly, we have a unemployment crisis coming straight at us like a like a high speed train. Uh, 730,000 people have lost their jobs in the second quarter of this year. That Mm. is a terrible uh, impact on them and their families. But millions more are likely to follow unless we start to do things to get the economy moving again. And that's not just about um, us all going out and and, uh, eating out to help out. You know, that, uh, that will help to tide things over for some sectors. It's about getting our economy moving internationally, getting trade routes reopened so that this small island nation, which punches above its weight as one of the world's great trading nations, can actually get out and do what it's good at again and start trading with the rest of the world. Because that's how we support millions of jobs in this country. Well, that's the thing. And I mean, the whole business of Heathrow Airport, as, as I was just saying, is not just about passenger traffic. It's about trade. Uh, it's about things and goods that come through it. I mean, I was quite staggered. I think it was a couple of years ago when I discovered quite how much smoked salmon comes through Heathrow Airport uh, every <laughs> single year. And it's not to just single that out. But, you know, there's a massive amount of business that goes through Heathrow and a massive amount of people employed in all the ancillary businesses around it. And what I'm hearing from people who have been flying, I'm not one of them, sadly, um, is that they go to the airport. It's very quiet. It's very deserted, rather like going out in London. Um, And it's just, you know, until we get the tourism back in a way, there's going to be a massive problem, isn't it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's not just about tourism. You're you're spot on that this is about the wider economy as a whole. Mm. Heathrow is a big port for tourists coming into this country. And we've seen very little of that happening at the moment. And that is killing the West End and other parts of the UK that rely on inbound tourism. But those passenger planes from Heathrow, many of which are going to long haul destinations such as the United States and India and Australia, they're just, they're just not flying. People cannot uh, go to those countries and then come back again without quarantining. And that is killing business. And it's the passenger planes from Heathrow that are carrying 
Britain's trade all over the world. The belly hold of passenger planes carries 40% of all the UK's exports uh, just from Heathrow alone. That's how important it is. And if the passengers aren't flying, then the goods aren't getting there either. And that means that uh, British exporters just cannot get their goods to market in a, in a quick and effective way. And it opens the door for other companies in other countries to get in and steal the, the markets that we have successfully developed. Right. And that's just not good enough. We are going to have to fight for our place in the world. And the government needs to step up and do the right things to get the economy reopened and do it as fast as possible. Well, I was hearing uh, from a, a, an Australian person that I met the other day talking about how they were trying to get back to Australia, but the flights kept getting cancelled. They're only allowing something like 30 passengers on a jumbo or on a big plane uh, back to Australia. So with those kinds of numbers, it's almost impossible um, to make any money at all, I would have thought. No, a lot of those routes just are not viable uh, at all. But the bigger, the biggest issue is that uh, countries uh, uh, in many cases have closed their borders, and the UK is one of those. Most markets are closed to us. Yeah. And, and actually, the, the quarantine covers more than 70% of all the markets that we normally serve out of Heathrow. So that's cut off 70% of the UK's long-haul markets from British traders. And that's a, that, that is strangling the UK economy. But there is a solution to this. And uh, what we see a lot of European countries moving to is testing people as an alternative to quarantine. Yeah. And while that's not perfect, uh, it takes a few days to get the, uh, the results. And sometimes you can only be tested after, say, five days. That is better than a 14-day quarantine. Mm. And it takes away the risk that people currently face going to countries in Europe that they might face this quarantine roulette where they don't know whether they're going to be able to come back to, to their normal life or whether they're going to have to self-isolate for 14 days. Well, I mean, look at what's going on with Portugal right now. I mean, it's a crazy situation. If somebody flies back from Portugal uh, to Heathrow, they're fine. If they fly back to Glasgow, they're not fine. They have to go into quarantine. I mean, there's a sort of disconnect going on. And it's almost as though it needs somebody... And, and I would say, without fear or favour, somebody with a business brain to get their heads around it and to say to the government, look, this is this is just chaotic. It's not going to be any good for anyone. And what's wrong with testing people, maybe even when before they fly, coming in back into Britain so they've already got a positive, t a negative test when they land? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. The, the perfect solution is that people are tested before they even get on the plane to make sure they don't have COVID. Mm. And that might have to happen a couple of days before they fly and they might need to self-isolate. But that is fine. That means that you know that uh, when you get on the plane, you are clean and so are all the other passengers. That will give a huge reassurance to everyone. But you also know that you're not going to run the risk of quarantine when you get to your destination. And we've been calling since May for the UK government to take a lead in setting up a common international standard in testing so that the UK government accepts tests that might take place in New York and vice versa. And that would allow people to start traveling more freely without any risk of importing infection. But we just have not seen the progress on that that we need to make if we're going to save millions of jobs in this country. Right. And so what would you like ideally to see start, starting next week? I mean, Parliament's back this week for the first week uh, in a while. Uh, what would you like to see coming out of Downing Street, coming out of the, uh, uh, the number 10 office in the next few days? Well, we know that the government isn't ready yet to move to this common international standard, but that is where we should be heading for. What they can do right now is to agree a testing regime, which may not be a single test on arrival. Uh, we're not calling for that. We're calling for a test on arrival and then a test after five days of quarantine, after which passengers can then go about their normal business. So if you can demonstrate you haven't got COVID, you can get out of quarantine early. That's exactly what a lot, a lot of other European countries are doing, and that's allowed them to get a head start on us in restarting their economies. We have the, uh, we have the capability to do that. In fact, we have a testing centre sitting idle at Heathrow right now, just waiting for the government to make a decision. Right. And whether that decision is you can, you can be let out after one day, five days or eight days, I don't care right now. Mm. Make a decision, get on with it, and let's get the economy moving. Yeah, exactly right. And how soon, uh, from the people that you talk to in the airline business out there, uh, can we start getting tourism back? Because I know that you say that's not the only thing that's lacking at the moment, but it's a pretty big part of, of what the business of Britain is all about. When you think about, say, parts of Scotland, where all they can rely on is tourism. All they can rely on is people going up there to play golf and fish and, and stay in hotels and, and rent properties and that kind of thing. And I mean, I'm staggered, actually that more and more people haven't just said we can't carry on we just haven't got any means anymore 
Well, I, I, I think you're right. People are clinging on by their fingernails yeah. to, uh, to to try to stay in business. I, I know that uh, the West End uh, businesses in particular are really struggling to keep going because they, even though they have no no visitors, they still have costs to keep running. They still need to um, support uh, people in, in pay and pay, mm. pay all their overhead costs as we do. Uh, and I think that unless we see action quickly, we will start to see, as the, the job retention scheme comes to an end, uh, significant redundancies coming in in the leisure and hospitality sector. And four million people in this country work in the wider leisure and hospitality sector. We have to stand up and protect those jobs. These are hardworking people right across the UK. And unless we help them uh, by getting international tourism moving again, unless we help the universities by getting international students coming back to this country again, millions of jobs could be lost mm. that could have been avoided. And do you think there's a kind of a disconnect as well between the scientific community or certainly those in the scientific community who are advising government and business? Because, you know, clearly there are people that I'm sure you speak to and that I speak to um, who believe that the virus is very much on the wane, particularly um, in uh, in the schools in this country, particularly in, uh, in in the cities of this country as well. There's no evidence whatsoever that more people are getting infected and, and going into hospital, as far as I know. Um, is there a better way of kind of getting the government to move more towards the business argument than the medical medical one? Well, there's a balance between the two. And if we, if you ask uh, one of the people in the Department for Health um, whether it is safe to do anything other than other than lockdown, they may well say, of course not. No, just just keep the entire economy under control. But we will all be out of a job uh, very quickly if that would be the case. Mm. The role of government is to make a balanced decision that protects people's lives and protects people's livelihoods. And with testing, we're not asking anyone to take any risk. We are saying, uh, let's check that no one is coming into this country from high risk countries uh, if they have COVID. And the vast, vast majority of people in the United States and India and even China do not have COVID. Right. We want those people to be able to get here and the others to stay at home. And testing will actually help with that. We know it works because that's exactly what we do with the NHS today. Right. Why can't we extend it to get our international trade moving and get global Britain to be a reality, not just a campaign slogan? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. John, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. John Holland Kay, uh, they're the CEO of Heathrow Airport, talking an awful lot of sense, it seems to me, because he is at the very heart of not only the trade business of this country, the passenger business of this country, uh, the entire kind of um, uh, you know export business of this country as well. And everything is kind of on hold. Everything has been on hold since the middle of March. And while there is some business going on, like I say, I've been absolutely staggered uh, by the lack of business that people can do, and yet they can somehow survive whatever it is that's going on. It really is quite an extraordinary state of affairs. We've got time to take some calls, though, so do make them uh, and get your voices heard. 0344 499 1000 is the number. We need to know what you're being told by your offices. We need to know what you're being told by your employers, because there are obviously some log jams in the system. I'm not going to start blaming individuals, but there are some individuals who are simply not ready or willing or able to come back into an office scenario, partly because many of them don't want to, sometimes partly because they're not being allowed to by their bosses. So we want to hear from you. 0344 499 1000. Got a tweet here from Mick uh, who wants to tell me some more about uh, uh, some reviews that he wants to mention. He says, Mike, like Ben Nevis, I've always been disappointed with the continued neglect and terrible state of disrepair at the Acropolis in Greece. I think you're absolutely right. Fall, shambles, shambles, isn't it? Falling down. It's a ruin, practically. This is Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk Radio. Lots and lots of great tweets coming in. Uh, I've got an incredible picture here that I've seen as well uh, from a Piccadilly Line train. Um, which is uh, basically at midday South Kensington, which for those of you who know London well, is right in the heart uh, of sort of museum land. It's where the, the Science Museum is. It's where the Museum of Natural History is. Uh, it's right by the Albert Hall as well, not far. Um, and here we are um, heading for the museums in a normal summer. There would be loads of people on this train. The train is literally completely empty. Nobody on it at all. That's terrible. That is awful. We can't go on like this, I promise you. Let's talk to Simon, uh, who's in Norfolk. Hello, Simon. Hi there, Mike. Uh, glad to talk to you. Nice um, to talk to you. What I, can I do uh, for you? Uh, you're my favourite presenter and my favourite radio station. Now, my frustration is boiling over yeah. about this, um, you know, the whole COVID situation, the financial situation. Now, I personally have worked right through. Um, I know other people who have been furloughed who've... Addresses. They've taken grant money, they've taken furlough money, um, they've taken uh, their rents paid, this is paid. Now, you've got 
thousands and thousands of other people like myself that have worked all the way through. Yeah. Um, what, what do we get out of it? Nothing. Right. But this is my point, yeah. Now, I don't know if you remember, Mike, but a few years ago, there was a situation where a lot of building societies converted from... Um, uh, like a mutuals, and they they become commercial. Yes. So if you had a few quid in your account, you would get like I think they gave people a thousand pound or two thousand mm. pound. Well, at the time we were in the sort of side dire straight times. Well, all those people spent that money because they're like normal working people. So that goes back into the economy. Now I don't know if I don't know any, I don't know whether ever anyone suggested. Uh, this is to the government, but if they were to, instead of just keep it, giving it away to people to eat out, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yeah. why don't they actually give it to normal people and say, look, you people have worked right through. You people have done this, you know, you've kept things going. You've had no bonus from it. Right. Now, me personally, if I was to get that, I would spend it. That would be back in the economy within a week. It would help the high streets. It would help holiday companies. It, 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 uh, I mean, the whole, the whole, the, the frustration for me is another thing is um, with the corona, the the the, the testing. You, it, how many people are you going to test? What what advantage have we got testing? All right, if it is so serious and people are dropping like flies, fair enough. But test everyone in the country. You know, you're going to find people with it. You're going to find people without it. Mm. You know, and it just seems like a crazy waste of money. Surely we should be concentrated on look. We have got to risk and take the responsibility for our own lives now. If you feel that you need to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you feel that you want to go out to dinner, go out to dinner. If you feel that you want to isolate at home, isolate at home. But if you just want to get on with life and get on with your business, I'm a farm contractor. If we stop working, the country stops eating. Exactly. That's a fact. Exactly. So what would you, you know, are you suggesting, Simon, that you and other key workers should get some kind of a, just a bonus, like a cash payment? I, 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 I'm not saying key workers. I, I wouldn't call us key workers. It hasn't affected me, Mike. I've just worked on like normal. Yeah. I'm actually driving a tractor now, talking to you, okay. harvesting potatoes. Right, okay? top man. Now, I, I, are they, I, are they I Charlotte potatoes? I, what sort of potatoes are they? They're, they're, they're not actually. They're, they're called Allison. All right. And they're very nice, and they will be on your supermarket shelves very soon. Uh, we do high quality, quality products in Norfolk. Um but but yeah yeah so so it wouldn't be oh no, let's give more something to key workers. It's more look at all the lorry drivers on the road. Yep. What have they had out of it? True. You know they're still getting up at five in the morning. Yep. They're probably having to wear a mask to do their deliveries, and they are getting absolutely nothing out of it. Now I'll give you an example. I had a hairdresser. I went in and I said to him, I booked on the online because that's how you have to do it now. And I said to him, I bet you're glad to be back to work. Yeah. And he went, do you know what? He goes, I'm not. He said they gave me a three thousand pound grant because we're all self-employed. He said they pay my rent, which is seven hundred pound a month. He said, and I was still cutting hair from eight in the morning until midday every day. He said, I wish it had gone forever. Yeah. So that is what you're up against. That's the now trouble. You've got isn't other it? sectors of the economy like us who are just carrying on, carrying on. It's made no difference to me, and I don't wear a mask. If the shop's not going to serve me, I won't go in there. Okay. You know, I haven't got to, I haven't got time for that sort of thing. I know there's people that believe in it, people that don't believe in it. But I spoke to nurses in my local hospital, which is in Kings Lynn, and they told me shocking stories from day one about we we had um, end of life patients and uh, we were on night shift and we had to go in the next day and find out that they died. Now this is back in, my, in March, yeah. and I believe it was the seventeenth. And this nurse, she was spitting fire. And she said, look, I've gone in and they've changed his death certificate to COVID-19. So from that day onwards, me and a lot of my friends, we, we, we've been almost laughing about it. Yeah. Um, well, I think a lot of people have, Simon. Listen, I'm going to let you go just because I've got a lot of people to talk to. But listen, appreciate your call. And thank you for um, harvesting the potatoes. I look forward to seeing them in the supermarket uh, coming up shortly. Let's talk to Asif, uh, who's in Lancashire, I think. Hi, Asif. Hi, uh, Mike. How are you doing? Right. Yeah, I'm good. What can I yeah. do for you? Uh, well, I wanted to speak about, uh, you know, the mi- migration crisis. Yes. And nobody is actually taking the bull by the horn mm. and speaking about it. We pay, you know, hard-earned money to the government in taxes. Yeah. Uh, not to be handed over to, you know, these so-called refugees and asylum seekers. Mm. That's for the good of the country. Yeah. You know, well, it's also being handed people. over to companies like Serco. Yeah, that's right. And what I what I want to argue for is that 
you know, these migrants are no longer, you know, coming over for a good life. Mm. It's actually a luxurious life. Let's call it by what it is, uh, because we're offering them a luxurious life. And that's what they're coming over for. A good life for just me, what, what I've got, what you've got, you know, here. But they're going, giving them way beyond what we here in Britain are entitled to. Yeah. We're not entitled to a free luxury hotel. No. So I think this whole thing about them coming over for a good life is a nonsense. It's got to be reworded. They're coming here for a luxurious yeah. life. And, and also, the more people the more people that come and are put up in those kind of circumstances, the more people are going to want to come. Absolutely. And this COVID-19, uh, you know, is hitting us hard. And we are being fined left, right and centre mm. and being put face masks and this and that. What quarantine is you know, being done on these people. How well, are they being allowed to... this is a good question the... because I've put that question to the government before and they've said, oh, yes, they're definitely being quarantined. Well, I'm not sure I trust them. No, I don't trust them uh, as far as I can form, actually, because there's nothing to trust. You know, you've got to build trust up and any trust this government had has evaporated on this whole issue because mm. we voted for Brexit and we didn't vote for a Brexit that would bring in a record number of migrants. No. Mike, let's be clear about that that Brexit didn't mean that it was a trade-off between we getting a, a Brexit whenever it happens and then record number of migrants landing here. Now, what's the use of that sort of Brexit? I know. It's not the Brexit that anybody voted for. No, it's know? absolutely so, not. Wanna... No, Asif, you're absolutely right. And we will put more of these questions to the Home Office and we will continue to do so. We'll continue to try and get Pretty Patel on the radio as well, which we've asked for repeatedly. Uh, let's get a quick more, uh, one more call in before the new Sue is in Daventry. Hello, Sue. Hi. Hi. Hello, Mike. Yeah, Thank hi. you very much for taking my call. I tried so many times. No, well, I'm glad to, uh, to, I'm, talk to. I know, I'm glad you got through. <laughs> what can I do for you? Well, I just wanted to uh, to say that um, I've seen you recommend the people to write an, a letter or an email to the local MP, yeah. which I did. And then he replied back to me. Mm. I think it's a lot of nonsense what he said. He said he doesn't know the number. Right. And then he said it's not his job that to you know to do with this. If he blamed the Home Office. Mm. And then more important than that, he said that it's our obligation or our duty to have to, to put these people because he worried that if we don't put them in the hotel, they might be homeless. Yeah. And then I answered him that, I said, that, hang on a minute, what about the existing homeless people in, in UK? They need a, they, they would like to have a four or five star hotel to, to, you know, to, to live in as I well. Know. I know. And it's extraordinary, him, isn't it? I, I, I said to my local and this about, Listen, it's not our obligation or our duty to please these people. No, it's really these not. Because they're illegal. Yeah, exactly right. And then I, I, I asked him a question as well. I'll tell you what, I asked you, did you lock your door when you go to bed at night? Yeah, I do. And why? Because I don't want people coming in. Exactly. That is a very simple, it's not a lot of physics at all. I said that you lock your door because yeah. you worry about the um, intruder or burglar. That's right. Exactly right. Into your house. The problem is, though, the laws at the moment, Sue, which we, which which we've had MPs on saying they need to change, is that if they do land on our shores, we do have a duty to look after them. That's the problem. But we don't have a duty to put them in a hotel. You're absolutely right. We could put them in a detention centre, which would be an entirely different kettle of fish. But we'll continue to have this conversation. I'm sure, Sue. Thanks so much for getting through to us, and thanks so much for trying. How about this one from Sully? Uh, just before we head for the news, and uh, before we head over to our homeschooling section, I visited Pompeii. Says Sully a couple of years ago and I told my wife I thought it was just a massive hoax just to attract tourists. Isn't it convenient that Mount Vesuvius erupts and destroys the whole town but manages to miss the visitors centre? <laughs> Absolutely right, very good. I see what you did there Sully, well played. Uh, this could go on for some time, you know, these reviews of historical uh, sites and other mountains. Anyone been up Everest? What's it like up there? Uh, let's get some news headlines with Ross Powell. Talk Radio. Half hour headlines. The Transport Secretary has ruled out the prospect of testing people at airports when they return from holiday. Grant Shapp says he sympathises with those holiday makers from Wales and Scotland who are now having to self isolate for 14 days after returning from Portugal. The Chief Executive of Heathrow Airport, John Holland Kay, has told Talk Radio that testing at airports is common in Europe and it should be in place here. What we see a lot of European countries moving to is testing people as an alternative to quarantine. Yeah. And while that's not perfect, uh, it takes a few days to get the uh, the results and sometimes you can only be tested after say five days 
that is better than a 14-day quarantine. Mm. And it takes away the risk that people currently face going to countries in Europe that they might face this quarantine roulette. Ministers appear split over reports that the former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott is to take up a role in post-Brexit trade talks. Conservative MP Greg Hans says he welcomes Mr Abbott's desire to help this country out, but Labour's West Streeting has criticised Matt Hancock's support of the decision. Petra Credlin is the former PM's Chief of Staff. She's told Talk Radio that despite Mr Abbott being a campaigner against same-sex marriage while having a gay sister, it makes him a man of principle. It makes him a politician of conviction. I mean, Julia Gillard, Kevin Rudd, both voted against gay marriage. Malcolm Turnbull was at one stage against gay marriage. Uh, Tony has had that view for a long time. He maintained that view. I think it would have been a very difficult view to have inside his own family. But he and his sister respectfully campaign on opposite sides of the issue. Their relationship's stronger than ever. Just some breaking news we're getting here at Talk Radio. Virgin Atlantic says it has completed a £1.2 billion rescue deal, but it does still plan to cut 1,150 more jobs. We'll bring you more on that as we get it here at Talk Radio. And the government is being urged to work with unions on a new job protection and upskilling scheme to help avoid a huge rise of unemployment this autumn. The TUC has warned ministers not to throw away the good work of the job retention scheme, which is said paid for the wages of millions of furloughed workers during the pandemic. A look at the weather. A wet start for parts of Scotland. Scotland, but the majority of England should be dry and bright. Some wet weather creeping into the southwest in the afternoon. Highs of 19 in the southeast. Across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker. Late night with Christo Fufas on Talk Radio. Big topics, big opinions, big conversations, and a place to have your say. So phone Christo and let's put the world to rights. Late night with Christo Fufas. Weeknights from 10 on Talk Radio. Mid morning with Mike Graham. Talk Radio. The Independent Republic of Mike Graham on Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk Radio. Time for the Aperio Awards coming up very soon. We didn't manage to do them last week. Martha wasn't here, but she's back uh, and they will be here uh, very shortly. Right now, though, it's time for us to do our homeschooling segment uh, because right after the news at 12.30, that is precisely what we do. Uh, Some of your kids may be back at school. Some of them may not be back until next week. Uh, We have asked for you to uh, keep us informed of how that's all going uh, because it's a new experience for an awful lot of people. We're going to talk now, though, to Natalia Duran, uh, who runs Urban Squirrels, a wildlife rescue unit that specialises in grey squirrels. Is this the time of year uh, when you tend to see more squirrels out and about because they're collecting their nuts for the autumn uh, to take them through the winter? I think I'm right in saying that. Natalia will probably correct me if I'm wrong. Natalia, very good afternoon to you. Hello. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's it's actually very interesting for me because I homeschooled my own four children. They're now young adults. Um, but yeah, we're talking about squirrels and uh, there, there's a lot to talk about. Um, well, the fact that they have a bushy tail, for example. <laughs> um, but no, that's uh, the Romans thought that their bushy tails were like a shadow. And uh-huh. that's why they called them skurus. Okay. We have the word obscure from that, that root of the, of the word and mm. squirrel. Um, our word, but it's interesting how in different languages people pick up different aspects of uh, squirrels. In uh, Russian, uh, they say belka, the root is white because they turned white in uh, winter. Right. And actually, our original British squirrel also went white in uh, winter camouflage for the snow. In Polish, I think it's vivurka, uh, something like that, to do with their movement, mm. the ability and the speed. Um, but I think also there's a there's an educational opportunity here to talk about the concept of biotic nativeness. Yes. Because of course, here in this country, we have uh, two types of squirrel. We have uh, the gray squirrel, uh, there are, well, about 2.7 million of them. They're very common. And if you do see a squirrel, it's far more likely to be uh, the gray squirrel, especially in, uh, in our cities where, well, they're actually probably the only diurnal wild mammal whom uh, city dwellers would see on a regular mm. basis. Um, so, uh, but uh, they are very common. They share the habitat with us, but they're not native. They were brought from America um, in the 19th century. And then there's also the red squirrel. Uh, as a species, they are native to this country. There are now about 280,000 of them, far fewer than the gray squirrel. They, um, well, they became virtually extinct before the gray squirrels were introduced because of habitat loss, and they do struggle here. Yeah. Now, but to be native in, in this country, um, you have to have lived here since the formation or since before the formation of the English Channel 8,000 years ago. 
So as an animal, if you had to cross the channel to come here, you're not native. Okay. Um, and when they were yeah. brought from America, were they brought kind of deliberately to be introduced or did they just come on ships and kind of just roam? Well, absolutely. They didn't pay pe people smugglers or animal smugglers to come here, no. Um, they were. It's, it's interesting, really. At the moment, the academic, the conservation fashion is for all things native, mm. native, alien, and bad. But it has not always been the case. In the 19th century, the fashion was the opposite. It was fashionable to collect animals and plants from all over the British Empire, in this case, and to try to establish them mm. on uh, different mm. continents. And well, for example, the Kew, Kew Gardens in London was a holding uh, place for plants from all over the empire. Um, so it was cutting edge, edge science. It was a climatization mm -hmm. movement and there was a climatization for animals as well. And it was in this context that gray squirrels were brought to this country and they uh, they have done very well for themselves. <laughs> They have, because everywhere you look, you can sort of see them. I mean, I've, I've, I've found myself, uh, you know, probably not going uh, in a, through an entire day in a period of 24 hours without seeing a squirrel in one form or another. And they are kind of fascinating creatures because they look a little bit like uh, rats. They look a little bit like mice, but, but somehow um, uh, they, 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 they conjure up a very different image to both of those creatures. Well, they look like rats with tails and they act like chimps yeah. uh, or even humans because they are very, very intelligent, which is part of the reason for their success, I suppose. Mm. And even, well, I mean, people who watch them in their gardens know that they, they are very clever. And those who try to feed birds in their gardens, for example, usually do battle with a gray squirrel that tries to get into the bird feeder. Mm. Um, I always find it a bit funny because it's, well, even if you invite people to your home, you end up not always feeding the ones you like and want, <laughs> let alone... No, it's interesting, and I'm told I'm told uh, that they've got four front teeth which never stop growing. That's right. Uh, yes, and it's uh, well, it's nice in a way for us uh, because we're on a rescue unit. It can cause great problems because if their teeth are not aligned properly, then they can grow into their skull, into their nasal cavity. Mm. And we have to burr them down sometimes, even remove the teeth. Um, but they cope amazingly well. I mean, it's very complicated surgery with squirrels. They're not like our teeth, but they do they do very well. Yeah. No, quite. And I'm told there's also a giant sort of giant squirrel that lives in India, which can grow up to in a, a one meter long. That sounds quite frightening. Uh, it is a little bit. If it's an animal that, uh, well, even in a tiny size can open walnuts, and yeah. if it's that size and as agile as anything, yes, it is a frightening prospect. <laughs> Plus, if it's uh, clever enough to deceive as well, because uh, squirrels have uh, something called theory of mind. Mm. It's um, Well, it's kind of the, the ability to understand what another person is thinking. It's uh, to know what someone else knows and how they're going to use that knowledge. And this theory of mind thing was in the past, it was just attributed to human beings. It was about 20 or 30 years ago, it was thought to be the distinctive feature of Homo sapiens. Then it was kind of begrudgingly granted to chimps. And now it looks like other animals have it, including the gray squirrel, because they, they've been seen. It's quite interesting. They've been seen uh, deceptively caching, burying nuts. Right. If the squirrel thinks that somebody else is watching who might steal the nut, she will make a big deal of digging a hole pushing something in it, covering it up, and then she runs off and buries the real nut elsewhere okay. while the potential thief explores the false cash. So, so, yeah, so, are, so, yeah, so, so during are, what yeah. you would call the sort of hibernation period, where do they generally hibernate? Because once they've presumably collected all of the, the nuts that they need for the, for the winter, where would they normally hibernate? Mm, oh, they don't actually hibernate. Uh, they, uh, they are less active. Well, they're particularly active now because they have to prepare for winter. Mm. In winter itself, they're less active, but they do not hibernate. They, they still come out. They still okay. kind of uh, and, uh, get, get their food, etc. Right. And you mentioned that the, the Romans had a different name for them. Have they been around since kind of the year dot, if you like? I mean, because obviously, um, you know, some creatures you can date all the way back to kind of the beginning of time. I mean, how long have they been? Have they been around? Were they here when the dinosaurs were here, I suppose, is the question. Mm, well, they, uh, they originated, the tree squirrels, the genus Ascurus, originated in Eurasia. Then they migrated to America about nine million years ago. Mm. That's, I suppose, where I, I know we pick up their history. I don't know, it might go back uh, longer than that. Then in America, they kind of diverged into several uh, species, and one of them, the gray squirrel, was then brought back to Eurasia as our gray squirrel. Right. And and normally speaking, what's their mating sort of practice? Do they, do they mate once a year? Do they mate for life? How does that go? Uh, 
gray squirrels are well as adults they're solitary creatures they live alongside each other but they don't they're not in packs or mm. groups of any sort uh, except for the first year of their life as juveniles they uh, sometimes stay in sibling groups uh -huh. many of them uh -huh. die so they, they say it's, it's good they're safety in numbers uh, gray squirrels have babies twice a year so they mate twice a year and they the peak well uh, as a rescue unit our peak of activity is april um and then now basically august september we're right. madly busy now um, but the interesting thing about squirrels is that they mate and breed in accordance with predicted food availability okay uh, so they seem to well, many trees uh they have a kind of pattern of producing seeds called masting where a bumper crop one year is followed by up to 10 years of uh, poor crops and squirrels somehow seem to predict when food is going to be abundant mm. and breed mm -hmm. more in those years and less if at all in the years where food is going to be scarce i mean the scientists don't know the exact mechanism for this predictive predictive ability they think that probably the size of cones or flowers or buds are their, their right. clues but yeah they, okay. they do it well and what about red squirrels finally are they likely to become more um, prevalent or are they still more likely to be kind of in the background because I was told I may not be I'm not sure if this is, this is true but the sort of the gray squirrels have more or less kind of um, sort of over over lauded it over them and, and made it difficult for them to ex coexist mm, well the thing is uh, gray squirrels do in this case have an alibi because red squirrels became virtually extinct before gray squirrels were introduced and that happened by the end of the 18th century because of habitat loss, particularly mm. in the mm. Industrial Revolution. And uh, really, uh, red squirrels are not as adaptable as gray squirrels. They need a very specific habitat right. in order to survive. They need, well, extensive pine forests or equivalent in wildlife corridors. And when this is not available for them, it, it is difficult for them. And really, well, I mean, yes, gray squirrels outcompete red squirrels in most of the current British habitat. And as far as your, your, your rescuing organization, Urban Squirrels, what is it that you actually do? Well, we take in injured or orphaned uh, squirrels, mostly babies, and uh, uh, rehabilitate them, hand rear them. And ordinarily, we would return them to the wild. This is legally problematic at the moment, as last year, but it's kind of it's a work in progress, basically. Right. Um, okay. But it's well because grey squirrels share the habitat with us in cities. They're very visible to people. And I get phone calls from people all the time saying, oh, my squirrel this and that. And I can say, well, in what sense is it your squirrel? And it tends to be, well, the squirrel they see in the way in the park or the garden. It is their friend. As far as they're concerned, it's their companion animal that happens to be free living. And when something happens to them or they're young, uh, people expect a rescue pathway to be there. And they're deeply shocked when they find out that this is uh, very often not there. Mm. They call the RSPCA, they say, well, we can only kill them, go to your local vet. The vet says we can only kill them, go to your local rescue centre. The local rescue centre says new legislation doesn't allow us to release them, we can only kill them. It becomes a proper nightmare, especially if you have a child in tow. Yes, absolutely. Well, lovely to speak to you, Natalia. Thank you very much indeed for the benefit of your knowledge. Natalia Doran, they're running Urban Squirrels, a wildlife rescue unit. So if there's any problem that you see with the squirrel, uh, you can get in touch with her. Uh, but fascinating creatures. You only ever do see them on their own that was the reason i asked about the whole uh, family scenario the mating practices because you only ever see squirrels i think on their own don't you this is talk radio coming up next it's time for the perry rewards it's friday it's 12 48 and it's time for this ladies and gentlemen welcome to the perry awards Bit of one-handed waving going on in there, which I'm not sure is entirely uh, in keeping with uh, the mm. rules. But you know, I guess one hand's better than none. I might have to issue incompetence reports. You may all have around. to, yeah. You may have to issue a proper instruction. Yes. Uh, to the rest of the control room. Very so, bad production, guys. Yes, Very bad production. Not good at all. Anyway, no. welcome back. Thank you. We missed you last week. Thank you so much. We did. Thank you. I, I sort of missed it as well, but also um, I did not because I was on holiday. Yes, well, that's, that's, that's entirely correct. We yes. all need a holiday. It's good to be back, though. It is. It's really, really and good to be back. And it's been great to have you here all week, which has also been good. Yes, thank you very Pretty much. Pretty good uh, and, uh, week of shows, I think we can say. Yeah, I'm quite pleased. We're quite happy about it. Quite pleased, good. yeah. yeah. Good numbers um, as well. Yes, I've heard. Yeah, I've heard very the rumours. Yes, it's um, all true. Anyway, yeah. 
Off you good go. Good afternoon. Thank you. And welcome Thank to the much. Perrier Awards. And for the new listeners, because yes. there's been plenty this week, this is where we look back over the past week of the so-called Independent Republic so of Mike called. Graham on Talk Radio yes. and choose our favourite moments. And as it's tradition, Mike, the first pair goes to you. Thank you and very it's much. become a cult classic is the oops, Mike forgets how to speak again. Good morning and welcome to the Indi- to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. I did it again just a minute ago, but it's probably did too you? late to be included. Yes, uh, yeah. there have been a couple of, uh, of of entries in the last hour. They have that um, have not been included. One of them for being a, a visual perrier, okay. which I still have not managed how to um, how to do. Ah. But uh, basi- basically, a uh, uh, pro Daisy in the control room managed to play a, an image of a squirrel. I saw that over the CEO of Heathrow. Yeah, and well, they do. They do get everywhere. <laughs> they do get you know, everywhere. They're quite annoying. So yeah, that was a little bit of an well incompetence done. report for yes. her. But uh, welcome to the team, yeah, Daisy. Very good. It's good to have Excellent you here. Excellent job. Um, last week, so I was not here, right. as we've mentioned, but um, Izzy um has been collecting a few Paris for me. Okay. And one of the things that happened is that uh, Ed Davy. Um, won the contest to become the Liberal Democrats leader, yes. whatever that means these days. And uh, you guys took the announcement live, I understand. We and did. off the back of it, you provided the harsh comment of the week. I actually thought Lady Moran would win because he's so boring, Ed Davy. He literally, you know, would put a glass eye to sleep. <laughs> I've never heard true. that before. Have you not? No. It's quite a good one, that. Yeah. Well, put the glass eye to sleep. Yeah. yeah. He's now going to go around the country, uh, boring for the Lib Dems, uh, telling everybody why, or actually, no, asking them all what he should do. Because the Lib Dems now <laughs> officially have no policy. I'm sorry. He said, Sh- shouldn't he know what to do already? Well, normally speaking, you know, you come at politics, you have some ideas, you tell the have people, plan, yeah. see whether they support you. Yeah. He's going the other way. He's going, what do you want me to believe in? And then I'll tell you what you believe I believe in, and then I'll go and do it. Well, Good luck with that, Ed. Yeah, well done. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, the next one I really like is the U-turn of the week. I've just been, um, uh, Pablo has just um, uh, tweeted me a rather delicious story about Extinction Rebellion spokeswoman Zion Lights, which is a pretty odd name, uh, quitting the Green Movement to become a lobbyist for nuclear power, saying that she's <laughs> changed her mind. <laughs> well done. That's very good, isn't it? Well played. Well done. Mm. Great transition. Mm. Um, the next one, uh, I thank to listener Steve for submitting it okay. via email. Last Friday, um, Howard Hughes was looking after the 7 till 10 p.m. slot and he won a pair of for the... Uh, the <laughs> I'll try again. And he won a pair for the impression of last week. Tune in for you on a Friday night across the United Kingdom. My name is Howard Hughes. We're going to be talking about one of the uh, the people behind Scooby-Doo. Did you love Scooby-Doo when you were a kid? I still love it now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear one what more on time. What is he doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> it does sound like scooby It is really good. It is really good. He also good. sounds like he's re- 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 recording from a cave. Yes, because um, it's from a different system, because there have been problems with the archive this week is that right retriever ah, okay. audio so uh, yeah. uh i many apologies for that slight incompetence the, report uh, there for the engineers then is that well, a larvin problem no well well we haven't got to the uh, james larvin parent ah, award for right. technical incompetence well, you can give him yet. one for that as well well but yeah definitely so thanks larvin mm. appreciate that well done uh, this uh week has actually been a really good one for impressions um mike congratulations you win a perry for your sort of tribute to adele she used to be famous for having a very nice, homely sort of attitude and talking like that a little bit and talking about how she still got the Chinese in and she still uh, liked to eat takeaway food and she still liked to, you know, do the dishes. All right. All right. It's true. That's yeah. how she used to sound. Well, I think maybe she still sounds like that. She probably does, I was she? trying to propagate that myth earlier mm. in the week as well that actually it's not her. You know, there's people... <laughs> You know, it's not Adele. She hasn't lost any weight at all. She's just hired somebody to pretend to be her. Like Joe Biden. Yeah, and it'll be, you know, that'll be her for the rest of time. It'd be great, well, listen, it? it could it be that. True. Yeah. Well, it's just a, it's just a theory. Yeah, just to it's probably just rubbish. put it out there. Yeah, yeah probably. We'll speak to Howard Hughes about that yes. um, on the Unexplained on Sunday. And uh, anyway, and of course, we've also got the uh, classic Megan impression of the week. Yes. Harry, Harry. Let's get a lot of money in uh, from Netflix and uh, let's make a lot of TV shows because we need our privacy. We don't need any more uh, money, but we, we do need our privacy. Our lives, both independent of each other and as a couple, have allowed us to understand the power of the human spirit, of courage, of resilience and the need for connection. Nobody yeah, asked me how I am. <laughs> what was that noise in the background? Was oh, that, that, was, that was yeah, that was Charlie yeah. Ray. Um, Do you know, talking. I think that second one was me trying to be an amalgamated voice of both of them. Oh, I think that was what I was going Is for. Is that what he was? Yeah, and it kind of morphed into her. Yeah, so it I started thought, off as a bit like yeah. him, 
and that so that's kind of where I was going with that. Yes, okay. Because well, they we'll probably speak with it. one voice. Well, of course, right. like a hybrid, uh, non-binary voice. Yes, yeah. like two narcissists into one. Oh my that god! Kind of thing. The accent though would be interesting though because it'd be like half British, half yeah, American. Yeah, exactly. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Well, keep your eyes on that. Yes, we will Good. definitely. Uh, I'm so glad I've got a Netflix subscription because <laughs> I would not want to miss this for the world, would mm. I? Uh, earlier in the week, we spoke to we spoke to Howard Cox from Fairfield, UK, and you delivered the pun of the week. They want to give local councils more power to beat the motorist over the head with a big stick. They now say they want to curb. Get it? Uh, parking on uh, pavements, right? I thought that was quite good. Well done. Thank you. I was very impressed. Different spelling, same pronunciation. Yes, yes. Which well must done. be hard for uh, people whose language is not English of the first uh, kind. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I was very proud of having spotted it. Yes, because, well Because, you done. know, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes I miss them, right. puns. Yeah. Because uh, I don't know well, all the words. Well, there are some words that you don't know, which is only natural. Well, exactly. Right? Exactly. And uh, and speaking of uh, people not knowing words, yes. uh, let's go to the next one. Because uh, while you're sometimes good with puns, you're not always good with words. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at these words in the Telegraph today. Um, Keech. Um, tripe i suppose i know um i don't know what on earth a moggy cake is or a scuffler i've no idea just don't know it's true yeah I have neither no do i no i could I have looked them know. up in fact i still don't know really <laughs> no. i think they're northern i guess so yeah. you're talking to dave chawner last week yes i don't remember the context because i did not listen to it i but, think we but... were talking about left-wing comedians weren't we oh yeah no 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 that was this week wasn't it was it yeah i don't know the weeks all roll into one after a while i know when you haven't been away for a year. Well, I know. You know, it starts know. to go a bit mad. I know. I, I don't blame <laughs> you for that. Uh, anyway, let's uh, finally, we're getting to this week's James Larvin Perry yes. Award for Technical Incompetence. Good. And it goes to our beloved regular contributor, Helen Dale. Um, the, um, so what you've, what you've got then is, um, something just popped up on the screen there. Now. We've discovered something about this, haven't we? This is a paranormal activity going yeah. on on this show. Scary. <laughs> Regular Scary listeners uh, will remember the co- the curse of uh, 1218, which happened uh, earlier in the year. Yeah. Phone box, which is our phone system, would go down every day at 1218. So if we were talking to anyone and yeah. it hit 1218, the calls immediately just, just, yeah. disappear. The line would go dead. Right. So for the last couple of days, we have the curse of 1118. 1118. <laughs> what is it with 18? I don't know. I don't know, which is when Skype wants to update ah. on the computer used for Zoom calls. Okay. So uh, we'll keep an eye on and that And that little one. click is that sort of little white square. Yeah, so appears. a white square pops mm. up on the screen. And she and was obviously put off by that. Yes, because they can see it as yes. well, the guests. Right. So um, It's a bit like the first time somebody talks in your ear while you're talking. Yes. And if you're not used to it, you just immediately stop talking. Correct. You know. Luckily, I'm used to it. Of course you are. Also, I never stop talking. No, of course. Yeah, Thankfully. we all know that as well. Yes. Um, anyway, because I'm running late, I'm going to skip on. to the last one, Sam. We're going to go for the one for the fans, the classic rug namer of the week. Excellent. Let's go to the phones first of all, though. Harry is in Buckinghamshire. Hello, Harry. Hi there, Graham. I mean, Mike. <laughs> That's OK. You'll get yourself a perrier for that, probably. <laughs> And there it is. And there it is. As if by magic. And uh, that's uh, that's me done. I think thank you for this very much. for this week. That's Super uh, thank you. That's all for the pre-rewards. There'll be more next week. <laughs>